Welcome to another episode of Chefs and Guests on the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Chef Jordan Anthony Brown, who's getting ready to open his very first restaurant called The Aperture in Cincinnati in the Walnut Hills area. Should be coming like 2022. So we kind of cover that in the podcast. But I was first introduced to Jordan uh, actually through Chef BJ Lieberman over at Chapman's. We were having a conversation many months ago, and he mentioned that one of his sous chefs from his Rose's Luxury Days was actually down in Cincinnati and was doing a pop-up and never made it down to Cincinnati for the pop-up that Jordan had, which was near the Finley Market area there. But then they did the guest chef dinner up at Chapman's when Jordan was cooking. Uh, so we went to that, had an amazing time. It was great food, always a good time at Chapman's. So pretty much was able to try his food firsthand, pretty blown away by it. It's amazing stuff. It's kind of Southern food, but simple, but the flavor there's way more flavor than you would think from reading kind of the description of the menu or anything like that. So reached out to Jordan and he was down to do the podcast. And that's kind of how we got connected and everything. He's got a really interesting story. I mean, he basically tiptoed uh, in both worlds of kind of being in the corporate world and then also cooking and eventually jumped into being, you know, in the chef world. Went to New York, uh, staged there at a couple of places, kind of bluffed his way into a few different kitchens and everything up there. Worked in DC, uh, wound up working with BJ and Aaron Silverman and all of them at Rose's Luxury for a couple of years, and then actually moved back to Cincinnati and he worked there for a few years, uh, different restaurants, Boca Restaurant Group and, and some other places, and then is now getting ready to open his own restaurant, The Aperture. So like I said, that'll open in like 2022. They got delayed because of COVID and construction and everything like that, but it's going in like this new complex that's being built. So it's being built from the ground up. So super excited. Cincinnati is getting another amazing restaurant, uh, it sounds like. I mean, Cincinnati's got a great food scene down there too as well. So compared to Columbus and everything, enjoy going down to Cincinnati and we'll be one of the first as soon as that place opens to, to get down there and, and see what they put together. But we cover Jordan's career, you know, all that stuff. So it's a pretty interesting story, pretty lengthy uh, episode too as well. But those are always fun for me, just kind of no time limit, just you go and, and whatever happens, happens. So make sure to follow them. On Instagram, you can follow Jordan at J Anthony Brown uh, all together, no dashes or anything like that. And also follow the aperture at the aperture Cincy and that's Cincy with an I. So the and then A P E R T U R E C I N C I. Some people like myself spell Cincy when abbreviating it with a Y. Some people do it with an I. I probably am the wrong person in that scenario, but. Make sure to follow them on Instagram uh, just to keep up with, you know, their opening progress and everything like that. And uh, make sure to follow us on Instagram too as well, at Spoon Mob, Twitter, Facebook. Check out the website. Check out past episodes of the podcast and the feed. Make sure to subscribe or follow the podcast, whatever platform. Putting everything up on YouTube. So we have a YouTube channel up there too if you want to listen to the podcast through um, your TV while you're working from home or in the office or whatever, you prefer to use YouTube for podcasts instead of a different player, you can subscribe to the channel on YouTube there. We have most of the the backlog of the episodes up. We'll load all the ones um, when Andrew came aboard to do the editing. So uh, without further delay, this is my conversation with Chef Jordan Anthony Brown of the soon to be open The Aperture in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cool. Well, thanks again for being flexible and coming on the podcast and taking some time out of your off day. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we had the opportunity, like I mentioned before, we kind of started recording to to go to the pop-up at, at Chapman's and experience your food firsthand. And it was awesome. It has that kind of Southern flair to it. But I wouldn't say it's exactly, I don't know, Southern, Southern. Like it's it's got your own unique twists and stuff to it. Um, and I definitely want to get into kind of all that too. But, you know, I always start at the beginning with everybody who comes on the podcast. You know, how did you first kind of get into cooking? How did you, you know, was it your first job in a restaurant? You just kind of stuck with it? Was it something that you always wanted to do growing up? Yeah, I have a pretty, I, mean, I guess, you know, strange route to how I got here, you know, compared to most people. You know, I didn't go to culinary school, how many of that. So, you know, like most people grew up, you know, eating food in the kitchens, uh, you know, at home. Um, I love going out to restaurants. We didn't do it a ton, but uh, something about it, you know, I think every time we go to a restaurant, I just, I just really, really enjoyed it. and. Uh, just kind of, you know, the whole experience, observing everything. And so I, mean, I think I would always tell people is that, you know, from a cooking standpoint, it, it really came from three, you know, people, three influences, one of which was my grandmother, born in Arkansas, raised in Cleveland. That's where a lot of my family's from. And so, you know, with her, it was a lot of, you know, cooking for a large group of people, all these big family gatherings when I saw them. So that was kind of the hospitality element of it. And then, you know, my mom um, is a great cook and, and um, you know, she has a very specific kind of 
set of recipes she always loves to make. Uh, that's like kind of the consistency part of it. And then my stepmom, who um, I, I met when I was, I think, eight or nine, was a big part of my life, um, was kind of the, the, I think the first person who introduced me to kind of a broader world of food. So for example, I specifically remember the first time she taught me how to make Caesar salad from scratch. So like egg yolk, you know, everything. And it was just like, wow, this is crazy. And I can't imagine how many Caesar salad dressings uh, I broke because I had no idea how to emulsify things at the time. I think I always enjoyed the aspect of eating and the cooking part too. Um, and obviously, as you get older, you know, any, you know, I think any chef will tell you that it's, it's, it's a lot different once you get into a restaurant kitchen. I think, you know, it's this, this thing where people, you know, great home cooks are great home cooks, but it's just a whole different world once you step foot into a kitchen. And so I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I mean, I really didn't, you know, get into it seriously uh, compared to a lot of people. You know, a lot of chefs, you, you know, they start as a dishwasher, et cetera, et cetera, when they're now 17, 18. I, I mean, I really, I mean, I'm 34 now. I don't think I really started cooking, you know, in a, in a serious way till I was, you know, in my, you know, almost to mid twenties, just because, of, you know, the way that, you know, I, I got to that path. So it's, it's interesting, you know, people ask me that question, like, how'd you end up here? And it's, it's sometimes even I have to take a step back and just say, I, I actually don't really know. I'm fortunate to be where I am. And, and uh, the experiences that I've had have been, been fascinating. Now you're born and raised Cincinnati, right? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm born and raised in Cincinnati. A lot of people make a lot of jokes about Cincinnati and Ohio, but uh, it's a great place to, to live. Did you ever get a chance to go to Arkansas since, you know, you have family, you know, your mom's from there? Or? I didn't. It's actually interesting. It's, uh, I've actually visited, I think, 40, 44, 45 of the 50 states, but that's not one of them. My dad was born there, but uh, he, he moved to Cleveland with his family when I think he was three years old. So um, I've actually never been down there. I, I missed a family reunion a couple of years ago. Did you put that on my radar now that I think about it? Since you don't have the kind of the traditional path, you know, working in restaurants, just always kind of stuck with it. You went to Wake Forest and you got a bachelor's in poli sci, and then you also got a master's in business management. What was your original career path? I was inches away from going to law school. I had actually been accepted to a couple schools, and this was, um, I guess, fall or summer 2009. And last minute, I just, I really don't know what happened. I just decided, like, I don't know if I want to do this. So that was right after I finished um, undergraduate. I was a, you know, poli sci and history major, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're the two career paths are typically either go to grad school for history, which I actually thought about, and then, or you go to law school. And so, I mean, I, it was just kind of in the books for me that I was going to go to law school. I mean, I think probably since I was, you know, 19, 20, I was, I, I thought that was my career path. And then I, I was actually, my dad and my stepmom were actually out of the country at the time. Um, they were, I think, were in Brazil, and I just, I was just sitting at home alone. Like, I, I don't know if I really want to do this. And uh, the investment I'd made up to that point, and like going to law school, like taking taking the LSAT and applications. So it's strange to even reflect on, you know, just tossing that aside. But uh, you know, I think this was, you know, 2009 was the, you know, kind of the the height of the Great Recession, like the housing crisis recession. So things were pretty in flux. Um, a lot of my really good friends from school were business majors. Um, a lot of them going into accounting or finance, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, honestly, that when I ended up doing that master's business program, you reflect back on it, it's honestly just a way to delay another year. I just was just like, I'm not ready to go into whatever the world has for me. So I went back to Wake Forest. And ironically, at the time, two of my, you know, best friends to this day needed a third roommate for their apartment. They were like, Oh, okay, let's go. They were, they were in a five year accounting program. So they had one more year to finish up. And uh, I sold a bunch of friends there, you know, friends with younger guys uh, that, that I still knew from school. Um, and so I was like, all right, great. I'm going back for another year. Let's let's run it back one more time. And, you know, it's a pretty expensive way to delay the the real world. So, you know, financially, uh, super okay decision. Um, it has paid off in a lot of ways because, you know, I, I got this second step of education, a lot of just kind of a crash course in business. Um, essentially, the, the best way I describe it to people is it's like think of it a half of an MBA. Um, so accounting, finance, you know, operations, whatever, you, you know, just again, like an 18-month crash course in business. And so that served me well. You know, coming out of that, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. It was interesting because I would, you know, meet with our counselors and say, I want to get into food and, you know, I still want to be involved in food. And, you know, to them, what that meant was working for like PepsiCo or Frito-Lay or something like that, which are obviously great companies to work for. I think our dean at the time was the ex-CEO of uh, PepsiCo, if I remember correctly. Those conversations to me, I remember were a little frustrating because, you know, probably you know, for them as well, because clearly we weren't talking about the same thing. I mean, you know, if I could go back, obviously, you know, you would, you know, think like hospitality management or, you know, getting into, you know, working like in a, for Houston's, you know, corporate restaurant group or something like that. It was just a disconnect. And I, I found that difficult. Um, but also, I think it was just a function of, you know, the fact that I was you know, 23 years old and didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. So 
I actually ended up um, leaving, you know, after after we graduated from grad school and moving to New York City. I had a lot of friends moving there. I had my my girlfriend at the time lived there, or you know, lived in Long Island. Um, and so I was like, hey, let's try New York. I, I've always wanted to do the big city. Massive mistake. I mean, moving to New York City in 2010 with no real job plan lined up, and I was you know crashing a friend's couch was uh, it, it was tough. And I think uh, what really made it most difficult is that I I, I clearly at the time couldn't decide if I wanted to go traditional job path, corporate or get into food. So, you know, I was there, I, I think from, you know, May 2010 till about September 2010. And, you know, one week I would, you know, go, you know, I had some friends that helped me set up some interviews and go do those like advertising firms. I think I had interviewed NBC and then, but then the next week I would go, you know, stop somewhere. And so it was just clearly like my mind, you know, I just couldn't make it up. And I, I don't think it actually, you know, from a job standpoint came across super positive because clearly, you know, both sides, you know, were, you know, why do you want this job? And I was like, I, you can't answer that for yourself. How are you going to answer for somebody else? So, you know, that's kind of how I ended up, you know, I did some stages in New York and that was probably the first time I realized, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I had friends in college, you know, and, and my family's like, oh, Jordan, you know, Jordan's a great cook. Like, you know, I was like, but then you get in some New York kitchens, you're like, oh God, I am in over my head. I mean, I had some really, really disastrous stages. Like I remember I went to, um, it's actually Danny Meyer place, you know, a great respect for him, one of the best restaurateurs in the country. Uh, Blue Smoke, a barbecue restaurant. I went in there, you know, did stage, and they were like, you know, what stations are you most, you know, ready to 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 work on? I was like, yeah, I grill. You know, I think I, you know, I think do grill. Yeah, and they're like, okay, so you know temperatures? I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Didn't know temperatures like at all. I was just like, I mean, I have a thermometer. Does that count? You know, only have like a couple knives. Just you know, again, like New York's the cream of the crop. You know, some of this, even you know, the mid tier kitchens in, in New York City are some you know, really good cooks. You know, speed, accuracy, precision, like whatever it is, like you're just going to find some of the best of the best. And I couldn't even you know hold a candle to that. So I remember I did this stage. You know, at the end of the stage, we're like, okay, you know, you seem like you you kind of know what you're doing out there, but uh, we want to do a tasting with you. And so basically, gave me an hour, and they were like, okay, you you know, give us an appetizer and an entree and whatever you want to walk in, everything's yours. Just, you know, got an hour. The kitchen was cleared up, cleaned out. And uh, I mean, sometimes I wish I could just email Danny Marble, like, hey, give me one more shot 10 years later. But I mean, at the time, it was just so bad. I mean, it was, I think I did something like a bruschetta and then like a salmon with cream sauce that probably had too much. I, it was bad. It was bad. The chefs were like, hey, listen, like you just don't seem like you're ready for this. And I was like, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. I will, uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity. And, you know, I left. And I was just, just like, that was brutal just brutal so um you know that that was my first you know, experience i had a couple other stages and, and just just little things happen we we're just like again the speed of it just the accuracy and just the things that you know i'm part of working in the kitchen you know people don't realize that you know, there's there's a lot of it that has less to do with cooking you know from a physical standpoint than you think it's just how you move organization just understanding how kitchens are supposed to work um you know obviously everyone's a little bit different but uh yeah i was in new york chewed up and spit out lasted maybe five six months and uh Right around you know the summer, I started kind of reconnecting with my now wife, and that's how I ended up in D.C. So that's kind of the long and short of my first experiences in professional kitchens, which were less than glamorous, if I could put it anyway. Before you even start staging and you're in New York, did you have any kitchen experience at all up to that point? No, I'm a professional. No, I had some restaurant experience. I my actual my first job um, was actually as a bus boy at a red lobster here in Cincinnati. And so, you know, I cleared tables, you know, I eat the cheddar bay biscuits. Or I don't care what anybody says is the best bread in the world. But yeah, that was, I, I had no back house experience. I mean, I, and then I actually waited tables for a while in college. And it was one of those things. It's almost like being, you know, like a little kid and like you go to your first like ball game or whatever. And you just look at the players, like seeing, you know, up close and personal, you know, oh, it looks so cool. So I, I would always find myself, you know, on the front of house side, you know, serving or busting tables or, you know, bar backing and just but looking at the kitchen like, yeah, that's that's kind of what I want to get into. But it always just seemed just, you know, they're just badass. Like I worked at a place in, in Winston-Salem called Village Tavern. And this, I just remember the cooks were just like the coolest guys. They always, you know, they were really nice, like looked after me. I was clearly like, you know, the greenhorn on the ship. Yeah, it always, you know, there was something about it. But, you know, to take that leap and obviously, you know, you, you know, the economics of it or you know, not, not the most, you know, positive thing in the world sometimes, you know, but you know, when you're, you know, 19, 20, you can take some chances. And to answer your question, no, I had no back house experience. I mean, I, a couple semi-sharp knives and, and a, a decent Caesar salad recipe is what I rolled in there with. So how did you wind up with Blue Smoke? Like your first, I mean, you started a couple places, but that one specifically, like, is it just you found out about it? Like, or did somebody tell you to go there and like, see if you could get in or? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I look back now and I'm just like, Oh my God, like what? Like, you know, I, it, I, yeah, I think it was just, again, like I was, I was crashing on a couch, you know, by, by a good buddy from college. He was actually my RA, my freshman year, shout out to, to chops who he's actually in media. So I'm going to make him listen to this. I mean, the indecision on my part, I mean, honestly, I probably just reeked of desperation in every way possible, both, you know, on the, the professional and the, you know, personal side, just like, I was just, my knowledge of New York restaurants or the, just the world of restaurants in general was so limited then. So yeah, I, I mean, honestly, at the time, I mean, this, again, this is what, 11 years ago. I didn't even know who Danny Meyer was. I was just like, seems okay. Craigslist. Awesome. Hey, here's my resume. It's like, okay, you have like no kitchen experience, but we're going to give you a shot. I'm like, awesome. I'll be there and crash and burn. Because you also staged at Townhouse and Anthos. Yeah. David Burke Townhouse. That was actually, I, they actually, they offered me a job. Still to this day, don't know why I didn't take that job. I think I was just scared. Honestly, I think I was just like, I, I'm by, they, they're going to like figure out in like two days. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then Anthos actually ended up working there for a while. So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's open anymore, but it's a midtown restaurant. Um, I think it was actually right around the corner from Rockefeller Center, 30 Rock, where the salad station there. And honestly, I remember the chef at the time was super, uh, yeah, actually what happened is I had staged there and he's basically like, look, I don't, you're not experienced enough for this. Like, I'm sorry. And I was like, oh, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Um, we'll go back to this couch that I'm crashing on and, and look at my wounds. And whatever for whatever reason, he called me a week later and he's like, hey, listen, we've had some stodges come in, but we just think you're a better fit and your attitude and just whatever. And I'm like, great, awesome. He's like, can you be here an hour? I'm like, sure. You know, I'm dirt poor at the time. I mean, I'm just, you know, borrowing a little money from the parents. So I was living at 85th and 3rd um, on the kind of Upper East-ish side. Um, I get my buddy's apartment and uh, I tailed it back down there. It's probably like 30 blocks, figuring out the New York subway system. I can't imagine how many times I messed up and ended up in like Queens or Brooklyn or something like that. Um, yeah, I ended up there. I actually ended up working there for a little while. Weird set of circumstances. I broke up with my then girlfriend at the time. We'd been dating for quite a while. So it was actually kind of a, a big blow. 22 years old. You know, the, you think the world's ending. I'm like, oh, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I'm going to listen to Vampire Weekend for, for two days straight. Something happened. I like twisted the shit out of my ankle, like on the subway. And so I had to like call out of work, which is now I know is like a big deal. And they're like, okay, well, are you going to be able to come back? I'm like, I think so. Like, I'll let you guys know. And they're like, uh, all right, well, your last paycheck's here. So um, it was just a very unceremonious kind of like weird ending to you know, which was actually a relatively good job in the sense where I, you know, I was getting broken into just, again, not just the cooking aspect of it is one thing, but it's, it's just like, how does the kitchen work? Like, you know, managing yourself, the organization, like, you know, your timing, things like that. And yeah, so I worked there very briefly. I think I ended up serving tables later in the summer for a really brief period of time at this super, super weird place. I don't even remember the name of it, honestly. The, I remember the GM was super nice, really nice guy. Um, it, but it was owned by, I think, frankly, a couple New York you know, Blue Bloods that just had some money to play with. But the restaurant was um, in a really weird location, like right by, I think, one of the expressways. I, I'm not even going to pretend like I remember what all the New York highways are. But uh, I mean, it was dead. You know, they, looking back on it now, it's just, they. you know, we do like six covers a night. I mean, I think it was actually to the point where it was so slow where the owner, I think, felt bad and would just give the servers like us like 150 bucks at the end of the night because we, you know, like 20 bucks in tips. You're like, well, this, I can't let you guys just like walk out the door with stuff. So. Yeah, it was weird. You know, my experience in New York was very, you know, I guess you could think of it from a positive angle. Like, what's a better place to get introduced to, to hospitality? You know, um, especially, you know, you're talking 2010. This is probably right before, like, the true national restaurant explosion, two, three years out, if you want to call it that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I did some front of house, back house, and some really rough experiences that just prove, like, you know, just because you can throw together a decent dinner, you know, for your parents or your girlfriend does not mean you are ready to go work a station in a New York kitchen or any kitchen for that matter. It doesn't matter where it is. So how'd you wind up in DC then after that? I reconnected with, you know, again, my now wife, um, we've been married six years yesterday, actually it was our anniversary. And, you know, I think I was just in a weird spot and you know, we reconnected and she came up to visit and she's from outside DC, McLean, Virginia, which is, you know, right across the bridge from Georgetown, basically, we started talking and, you know, whatever. And I actually had, a, you know, a bunch of friends that lived in DC at the time, too. So, you know, Wake Forest has, you know, I don't know what it now, but had a weird pipeline where you basically ended up in one of four places, New York, DC, Charlotte, or you went back home to where you were from. So ton of friends in New York, ton of friends in Charlotte, and then a good amount of people in DC, um, including some people that I'd gone to grad school with. So we, yeah, we reconnected. She came up to visit. You know, I went down one time, you know, things got a little more serious. And uh, yeah, I, I went down and actually that's 
sort of when I started taking the restaurant thing a little more seriously, I was like, okay, you need to like present yourself appropriately. Like, you know, none of the smoke and mirror shit that, you know, you're doing of I'm a good cook. It's like, okay, be honest. Be like, Hey, look, I want to get into kitchens. I'm not the most experienced, but you know, I'll work hard, you know, and, and, you know, just be honest about it instead of, you know, pretending that you're something you're not, which, you know, obviously I, yeah, as I said, how that worked out for me was not the, the most positive. And yeah, I, basically the, the, the clock had expired in New York. You know, I was crashing on a friend's couch. I was just like, look, you know, we were just had a couple of beers when I was like, yeah, he's like, look, you know, you, you have a plan, like whatever. I'm like, no, nah, honestly, man, I, I got a hightailed out of here. And I, you know, you know, I was, I think it, you know, sort of overstayed my welcome. He's a great friend to this day, but you know, you can only crash the couch for so long. I was like, I just want to sleep in a bed. And so I went down to stage at a place in DC called 1789, which is still open. It's a, a very old historic restaurant in uh, Georgetown, you know, fine dining, you know, white tablecloth, um, that sort of thing. And the chef at the time um, is it was a guy named Dan Juicy. So that name, um, you know, if there's you know whoever is in listening to this and people really want to go hard food nerd, Dan was great. You know, he you know he's my first true chef in the sense where he you know shepherded me and you know was probably more patient with me than he needed to be. And I went down there. You know, he was like, "Look, I don't you know think you're the most experienced, but you know you seem like you have a good attitude. Love we'll to bring you on." And I, I yeah, it was great, awesome. And you know, my girlfriend at the time. My wife, she lived uh, actually not far from the restaurant. So we went back to her house with the roommates, had some wine, celebrated. Oh, I finally got a job, et cetera. And I, I mean, I, I, I think that was probably, I don't know, Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Bus back to New York, pack up all my stuff. And I'm, I'm, I had a bus going out to D.C. on Friday. I think I was like, you know, last or all, rolled back to my friend's apartment. It was just like, hey, I'm out. He's like, oh, well, we got to go out and celebrate. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So we go down. Down the street, this place uh, right by him called the Stumble Inn, which was had the greatest chicken, some really good chicken wings, like just dive bar. Go back, pack all my stuff. We go out, we get lit up. And the next morning, I'm like, oh, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I had to like get on a bus to DC to like basically go start the next chapter of my life um, in like three hours. And so like when I had gone to New York, I had, you know, a couple suitcases, I just like, you know, whatever. Like at the time, you're like essentials, but it's like, it's New York in the summer. It's like, you you don't need all this stuff. Like it's 89 degrees at, at 10 o'clock at night and everything smells like garbage. So I, I mean, I was just like, had a little, you know, I was hungover. I'm like, Oh my God. And so, and I, I, I remember I get down, this is before Uber, so, you know, taxis and I'm like, okay, like I, let me get a taxi. And I like, remember I like look at my bank account. I'm like, Oh God, I don't have money for taxi. Like, I'm just like, Oh my God, I had to get to Penn station like right now. So I subway, I'm, I'm like literally double rolling these gigantic, like two, like true, like blue, like suitcases, not like duffel bags, like suitcases, like through Manhattan. I like get down to the, the subway station. I'm like, cool. I got a little money on my Metro car and I'm like hopping trains trying to get there. And, um, I make it to the bus like just in time. Like I, I'm sweating bullets. It, it's so hot. And I just, you know, look, it, I'm probably not the, the, the worst person to ever have to do something weird in, in New York. But I just remember getting on that bus and I was like, all right, get me the hell out of here. Like, I'm done. I'm out. Like, I, thanks, New York. It's like the LCD sound system track. It's like, New York, I love you, but you're, you're bringing me down. Like, I, I lost. Like, I took an L. So, um, yeah, I ended up in D.C., started at that job, and it was great. Again, my first foray into like my first stable kitchen job. Um, worked the salad station. It was you know I I was trained by a couple of really nice um, I did women who were super patient with me. But you know it was a tough kitchen. I mean the really high technique. You know a lot of French you know French technique things that I know now that you know obviously I had no no business getting involved in. But Dan Juicy was um, super patient with me. He's he's really tall. Um, he's like six 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 seven. And, and the the reason I say his name like that is for two reasons. One. He ended up, and this is after I was, I had left the restaurant long after he ended up going to Noma and Copenhagen and ended up, you know, rising the ranks and kind of in a weird, in the same way I did, but obviously he was much more talented and experienced. Went there on a whim, um, as I understand it, you know, as an unpaid stodge and ended up becoming the head chef, like Rene Redzepi's like right hand guy. Um, like if you've ever seen, for example, the Anthony Maria Parts Unknown episode in Copenhagen, he's there. He's right there. He's, you know, tall guy, you know, dark hair, just, you know, you can't miss him because, you know, he's like six, six, four, six, five. And then now he's, he's doing something super cool, which I actually follow pretty closely called Brigade, which is um, basically revamping and really focusing on how do we make school or sorry, food. Is it? Yeah. Okay. He's doing the school lunch thing in like Baltimore, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's all over the place. I mean, I think he's, I don't know where he's based at, but you know, Denver, Baltimore, Connecticut. So a super cool organization. Um, that, you know, something, you know, you think of, you know, 
the second act of somebody's very illustrious, you know, you have head chef in one of the best restaurants that'll probably ever exist. But yeah, he was super patient with me. Really nice. That's how I ended up in DC, worked there for, for a little while. And that was, uh, DC itself was a big, I mean, massive chapter in my life. So. Cause your next place that you wind up cooking at is the iron gate, but you also have a stint in there that you're back kind of in the corporate world. So again, the, you know, obviously, uh, my end decision, um, ended up, you know, your path is your path. So, you know, it, it, things work out the way they're supposed to. But, uh, yeah, I worked at 1789 for, I think, like nine, 10 months and, you know, ended up on the hotline, um, which was at the time, like, basically the best thing that ever happened. I was like, oh my God, I'm a real cook now. Like, awesome. But, you know, at the time, my, you know, a lot of my friends were in the nine to five world. Weekends, I wasn't there. I missed a lot of, you know, I would try and run out, you know, after service and, and grab a drink. And, uh, my now wife, um, Hannah, is uh she was a teacher and so again kind of more the, the monday through friday and i think at the time i just you know i was like i don't i'm not i don't i just wasn't ready to take on the sacrifices that it requires frankly to to be a cook to be a chef to, to miss weekends and i think i got to a point where i was just like i i don't know if i want to do this for real you know and, and call it utilizing the degree that you know i and my family paid a lot of money for so i applied to a place called cb which was um i think now has been acquired by a larger company, basically consulting I means DC, you know, that's, that's a big trade there, I guess, for lack of a better word. So ended up, yeah, I, I, I left and worked there. And, you know, I was in there kind of harking back to my somewhat desire. And I think maybe, you know, in a weird way, I still law school was still on my mind, because I ended up in the basically legal and compliance division of the company. And so basically, the way the company worked is, you know, they you know, imagine every aspect of a corporation, finance, accounting, marketing, sales, whatever. And, and they basically had a division that would consult and do projects for that. So it was very like kind of one-to-one -one aligned with, you know, major corporations and some mid-market. I actually had some super cool experiences there and meeting with some pretty, you know, high-level executives and going on, you know, a couple of business trips um, that, you know, at the time, I think I probably, you know, overlooked and uh, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted, but it was what I needed. Um, and so I worked there for three years. And just it was a good time for me to, you know, at the time, I think, you know, 20, 23 to 26 or you know, 22 to 25, you know, you start figuring out what you want. And so, you know, I was able to enjoy weekends with my friends, go on some trips. And you know, really, you know, those years really when my wife and I started to develop our you know relationship now that we've been married for six years. And so I think it was just what I needed at the time. I think, you know, it was one of those where, you know, I just I get it out of my system, I guess, get that last little itch of you know, the nine to five world. Um, and so, yeah, but even, even while I was there, I was still, you know, I'd be on my computer, like hiding in my cubicle, like looking at recipes and like starting, like started like a little food blog and like food photography. And I think that's probably right around the time when like food blogs themselves um, started to, to kind of blow up, like, you know, like Smitten Kitchen and things like that, that are now, you know, you know, relatively uh, well known. So yeah, it was, it, it, you know, it was kind of like one of those where it's like, you know, an itch you can't scratch. It was just always kind of there. And, you know, I was, you know, always kind of 90% in the office and 10% being like, you know, where are we going to go after this weekend? You know, which was, I think, probably a big part of it too. Now to think about it is because, you know, I had the income to, you know, go out to eat, enjoy restaurants and go on dates with my wife and friends. And, and that, I think honestly, yeah, realistically, that's when I really started to be like, okay, food is really, you know, DC at the time, I think was really starting to explode. I mean, that's, you know, now it's, you know, I think you call it, you know, one of the top, you know, three to five restaurant markets in the country, but that's really when it started you know, moving on from like the power lunch, you know, steakhouse vibe to a lot more independent, really homegrown restaurants. Was there a moment during your three year return to the corporate world that you just had this moment where you're just like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Or, or did that never really happen? And you just kind of naturally like phased out of it? No, it did. It, and actually, you know, not to bum out the, the podcast. Yeah. So um, it, it's actually the, the question you pose may perhaps be the biggest inflection point of, of my entire life up to this point. Right around, I think, the two-year mark. So I'd been at CB for almost two years. To take a quick step back, I, you know, I was raised... You know, my mom and my dad split when I was about seven, eight years old. And then my dad you know, ended up with my stepmom. All three of them were huge influences in my life or have been, you know, for different reasons. And, you know, on one end, obviously, yes, child or divorce. I think people, you know, can look at that. And, and it's not positive for a lot of reasons for a lot of people. For me... Obviously, you know, it's difficult, but, you know, the benefit is I, I mean, I truly had three parents that cared about me deeply, um, and my sister as well, you know, my stepsister. And so, you know, I look at that and, you know, when you're, you're 10 years old, your world's falling apart. Now I'm like, man, I really, I had three. Some people don't even have one, if that makes sense. Um, and, and you try to look at things from a positive angle. My dad's birthday, um, was October 19th. 
Um, or is October 19th, which is coming up. So on that day, um, October 19th, 2012, I remember I still working at CB. I was, you know, Friday, I was uh, wearing my, you know, corporate attire and then had to go get, I went to go get a haircut. Now I remember pouring rain. I was like soaking wet through the barbershop. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm just like dripping all over the floor. And I was just like, it was one of those. I'm like, I'm, this sucks. I, I just want to get my haircut, go home and like go out with my friends for the weekend. Like I'm done with this week. Get back home, you know, whatever. Talking to my friend, uh, my pretty much my best friend, Brad Snaps, what we used to call him. But uh, his wife made us stop doing that. You know, I'm getting dressed. I'm like, all right, going out, talking to my roommate. He's like, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm going this. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do that. Actually, I called my dad left a message for him. I'm like, Hey, you know, Hey bud, you know, happy birthday. Sorry. I didn't catch up with you earlier. Give me a call. Let me get a chance. I, I think as soon as I hung the phone up, my sister called me. She's like, Hey, and left me a message. I think, cause I was on the other line. She was like, Hey, dad and Sherry, Sherry's my, my stepmom's name. We're in an accident. You need to call me right now. Um, and I'm like, okay, like, you know, fender bender, what's going on? Like, I'm like, let me go back home and just process this. Just like call my sister. And I called her and I was like, Hey, what, what's going on? She's like, really upset. She's like, Hey, they were in a really, really bad accident. They're both like going to the hospital, like airlifted, you know, et cetera. You need to keep your phone by you. I'm like, Oh, okay. God. Okay. So get back to the apartment, you know, uh, fortunately, and, I, and this isn't for any bad reason, cause he's still one of my good friends. My roommate wasn't there. I just think it probably would have been weird for him to have to like process and deal with that with me in the moment. But long story short, you know, I sat around and my, um, my wife, uh, now Hannah was at the time was actually in grad school in Boston. So I called her. I'm like, Hey, yeah, you know, my dad share an accident. And like Taylor's going to call me. She's like, Oh my God. Okay. Well, you know, keep me posted. Long story short, my stepmom passed away that night. She, she died from her injuries in the accident, just too traumatic. And my dad was alive, you know, never woke up, was pretty much in, in a coma for about a month. Um, and ended up dying on, I think November 16th. So basically what had happened in between that time period is, you know, that night, you know, my stepmom died. I got the call and obviously, you know, emotion. I lost it, lost it, lost it. And my sister was like, yeah, you need, you need to come home. And so I'm like, okay, book a plane ticket. And I, you know, Hannah was, she was like, okay, do you want me to come with you? I'm like, I know you don't need to do that, but if you can, I would really want you to be with me. So actually what I ended up doing is flying to Logan in Boston. And then she met me there when, and then we flew from there to Cincinnati. Uh, My mom, is still alive. Um, I should have saw her about an hour ago. I had just moved back to Cincinnati from Columbus with her sister, my aunt, um, which actually ended up being kind of like the home base for just that period of time. And, and, you know, obviously a really difficult moment, but, you know, the positives were just everybody from both sides came together and just whatever passed was just put aside and was like, let's just take care of everybody, especially my sister and me and my stepsister, who, you know, lost her mom. And then, yeah, it was just a really weird time. And, um, you know, I was home for about a week. You know, I took obviously time off work. My boss was like, just don't think about this at all. You let us know when you're ready to come back. And just kind of a, just, uh, you know, surreal, just absolutely surreal period of time. And, you know, I was home in Cincinnati. And I, you know, I was when I left for college, I was just like, I'm never coming back. I'm, I'm out of Ohio. Like I'm never I'm moving to the big set. I figured I'd end up in like LA or New York or, or something like that. Obviously, New York, that worked out real well for me. So yeah, I went back to DC and was just in a haze. And actually, at the time, what was really, this is just one of those, like, you know, when it rains, it pours. My roommate and I, my friend Will, um, had been, like, we'd lived together for, I think, three years at that point or two, three years. So, we, you know, we we're good friends, like comfortable, but um, we lived in Arlington, Virginia. And so he wanted to stay in Arlington, but I wanted to do DC proper. And so we actually, you know, not in a bad way, whatever. Yeah, you know, I'm going to go move. Yeah. He, he moved in with one of our friends and I moved into like a row house with like four roommates I'd never met. All that is to say, it's just like a really weird time to, to move into an uncomfortable and unknown scenario. You know, I just been through obviously a huge loss. And so what had actually happened is, you know, my stepmom, you know, we had her, her memorial service. She was a teacher. So we had it at her, her school she taught at. And then I went back for a while because, you know, my sister and my aunt, you know, my dad's sister and then his parents. And, and they were just like, hey, there's nothing you can really do. You should just head back. So I went back. Worked, you know, kind of at a, a ease back in, you know, everybody at the office was like, hey, just take it easy. Like, come in when you come in and you leave when you leave. Like, it's fine. And then they moved my dad to a uh, basically kind of a hospice facility. And uh, he had essentially had, I mean, as I understand, it, had massive brain trauma. And so basically, they told us, you know, if he does wake up, he will not wake up in the way that you know him, if that makes sense. And ironically, at the time, one of the, 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 head doctor of the hospital, his son and I were uh, same year in high school um, in Cincinnati. Um, and so word had gotten through to him through, you know, some buddies from high school that that was the situation we're in. And so 
he really went out of his way to like, you know, look after us. You know, obviously he's a head doctor. He's need to like take care of individual patients, but you know, he really, you know, took care of us and then just was honest with us about things. And, uh, um, and my dad got moved to a facility from what I understand, he developed sepsis, which is basically blood poisoning for most people, especially in any kind of altered or diminished state is, is essentially fatal in any way you could process it. So you know, I, I don't know what happened. You know, it's, you know obviously it's, it's largely irrelevant now, um, as grim as that sounds, but my sister called me again, you know, I shout out to my sister. I love you who had to make a lot of really difficult phone calls in a very short period of time. You know, call me. He's like, "Hey, I, Dad's not going to last much long. You need to come home." And so, flew back again. You know, we, you know, said our goodbyes, and he was basically being kept alive by, you know, some combination of of drugs and steroids. And I couldn't emotionally deal with it at the time, which is, you know, again, my sister. You know, the, my sister and my grandma, who has passed on now, his mother. I mean, I especially now having a son of my own, I don't. Even, it's hard for me to even thought of this. You know, stayed in the hospital. I was like, I can't, I got to go. Like, I can't emotionally deal with this. And so they essentially held his hand as they, you know, pulled the plug, for lack of a better term. And that was it. So that, you know, within, you know, basically a month span, I lost my, my stepmom and my dad. And that was, you know, to answer your question in the most, sorry, bummer of a way. <laughs> um, that's, uh, you know, that really sent me on a weird path of, uh, you know, I think I went back to DC after my dad's funeral, um, which was two days after Thanksgiving. So then, and it, you know, from a food standpoint, you know, that Thanksgiving was going to be the first one where, you know, everybody put their differences aside and was like, we're all going to my mom's house. And it's, you know, big gathering, people were really excited, coordinating on the food. And you're probably gonna be like 30, 40 people there. You know, obviously everybody was still there minus two. And so, you know, it ended up kind of being a really somber day. You know, I went back to DC and I was just in a haze. I was just in a haze. And, you know, I just was just like, what just happened? And, you know, at the time, I don't think I'd even really processed how significant that was. But the long and short of it is, you know, over time, you know, that was in, you know, November 2012. And basically by I think the spring of the next year, I'd left my corporate job. I just, I never lost like that. You know, I know a couple older relatives that, you know, their their time had had come and gone. Natural course of life, nothing that wasn't supposed to happen. But uh, that for me was like, okay, I am gonna die one day. Am I happy what I'm doing right now with with what I'm doing right now? You know, I, you know, my performance at work wasn't great. I was just, I'm half here. And even my boss said, Hey, are you okay? Like, you don't seem like you're, you're really doing, you know, the things you normally do. And it ended up leading to me leaving on good terms. Um, but you know, that was and when I was like, okay, like I want to have a more decisive path. You know, I want to, you know, make my choices, not have the choices be made for me. And so that's, uh, really how I ended up starting to take the, the whole kitchen thing seriously. How old are you roughly around this time? Like, shit, I'm way too young to be not remembering how old I was. I'm not old enough. When the accident happened, I just turned 25. Um, so basically, you know, and I, again, I, so I had that year at 1789, skipped three years, corporate world. And then basically by the time before I turned 26, I was, you know, firmly back in the kitchens. Yeah. Once you leave your kind of corporate job, how did you, I mean, obviously it sounds like you realized like, this is what you're passionate about. You're passionate about cooking. You definitely want to get into that industry and really see it through. How did you kind of wind up at Iron Gate? Yeah, I mean, I threw some resumes out there. Um, I think I had a little bit better, you know, sense of my one, my own ability to the restaurant scene than having eaten and paid attention to what was actually going on. And then, of course, you know, the big part was, um, you know, at the time, my my we were, you know, my wife and I had moved in together, um, and so you know, it was a joint decision. You know, we were you know, a couple at that point. So I was like, hey, I'm going to leave this relatively comfortable job for a much less comfortable scenario and then a much more uncertain one. Um, I think I just threw some resumes. I actually think I ended up doing um, in that time period like five or six stages. Um, I staged at what Iron Gate, I mean Birch and Barley, um, a bunch of places, and then also at the time a place called Roses Luxury, which will you know I'm sure we'll come back to that. But um, they just they only opened about a year and change ago, and I staged there and some other places, and you know got some job offers, got some you know you know thanks but no thanks. Um, and ended up, you know, Wiring Gate just uh, seemed like a good fit. I don't, I, you know, at the time, like I, I just didn't have enough experience to really make conscious decisions. I was like, okay, it was just like, does this feel right, one way or another? And that, that's, that's kind of how I ended up making those decisions at that point in time. And you were like a line cook there, right? You were just on the kitchen line. Yeah, started on uh, Cold Station. Um, you know, it was a, it's a small kitchen, but you know, a really beautiful restaurant, with a huge patio. They, at the time, we're doing both like kind of a meze style menu, but also like a more tasting menu, um, you know, prefix inside, um, work cold side and then like the wood fired oven, you know, worked my way through all the stations and, you know, I had some 
know, decent responsibility or at least trust from from the managers there. You recollect, you know, you, you reflect on things, and I think Iron Gate, the type of food and the style of food, probably influenced me more than I probably realized at the time, or at least you know where I am now and what I'm, you know, preparing to do. But I think the biggest thing about Iron Gate, you know, beyond like that was probably the first time I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a confident, like I know what I'm doing, like I can work my station, I can prep my station, I can get through service, like I can get through the week and not have to have my hand held too much. But I think the biggest thing there was that I met one of the other cooks there at the time, a guy named Christos, um, who was working the grill station and had just come out of culinary school. Um, and it's one of my closest, closest friends. I love him to death. Shout out Christos. I'm gonna make you listen to this too. And then the sous chef at the time, well, two sous chefs, one of them's named Jim uh, DiCio and the other was Seth Wells, um, who both fantastic, just amazing cooks and just people, like really, really, really amazing people. So working under them was a really influential experience. And Tony, the head chef at the time was, you know, he was great too, but you know, obviously sous chefs deal with the, the green guy. You know, I'm not, I'm not dealing with it, but um, so the thing about Iron Gate was that, um, you know, wood fire, oven and grill, fresh pasta, like a lot of things that I hadn't seen before, you know, in like a high capacity and just kind of the style of food that was, you know, Tony um, is focused, you know, as far as I still understand it, you know, on Mediterranean Italian. So, you know, think like super like stuff that's like works done behind the scenes, like you see less than what goes on to the plate. But I mean, that in the most positive way, like a really beautiful grilled meat. You know, with like a like a simple sauce, a grilled octopus. You know, simple pastas and just things where I was like, you know, you get kind of uh, you know these rose colored glasses about these like hyper fine dining restaurants, but then you see, and that's you know beautiful. I mean, you know, you think of like you're the best of the best, but then you also see a different version of that where it's executed, frankly, at the same level, but just so rustic. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. I really enjoy this. I mean, like one of the shit out of my station uh, when I worked at Wood Fargo was like literally my taki mushrooms. Roast in the oven, sea salt, olive oil. And I'm just like, these taste incredible. It's just as good as any, you know, steak or, or pork chop I've ever had. You know, simple grilled octopus with just, you know, avga lemon sauce and just stuff I hadn't seen before. And it was just one of those where it's like, man, we're really putting in the work and using great product too to create food that seems hyper simple, but really there was a lot of effort put in behind the scenes. And so that was a really good experience for me. And that was when I, I think I really became like a more confident cook. And, you know, I worked salads and cold and pastry and then the wood fired oven and the pasta station and the saute. And so I really worked my way up. And so, you know, even to the point, you know, at the time, Tony had said, you know, put in a little more time here. He'd see you as a sous chef. And, you know, for me at the time, that was a big deal. I was just like, look, I went from, I mean, completely crashing and burning on stages to, you know, somebody trust me to, you know, make managerial and, and independent decisions in the kitchen and the restaurant that they have their own money in. So um, I felt good about that. I met a lot of really good people there again, you know, Seth and Jim. Jim, I think is, I think he's BC. I, I, remember, I think he might be in Wilmington, um, Delaware, but Seth, uh, I mean, you know, we'll touch on him more, I'm sure. But uh, one of my closest friends, I consider him uh, one of my primary mentors. I mean, frankly, one of the more influential people in my life. I uh, mean, Christos, same. You know, we came up together. You know, it was the first time I was like, okay, I can really do this. I can see what this looks like from a growth standpoint. And it was a great experience. You know, a lot of the, the things, the way I think about food now, a lot of it was influenced by that restaurant and what we did there. You're self-taught. You're at this point in your career where you you start to have kind of like the confidence in what you're doing too. And like people are, you know, letting you make decisions. Did you ever consider going to culinary school at all? I don't think so. I think that ship had just sailed. I think, I mean, frankly, one, just because of my age. Well, I mean, which, I mean, people go to culinary school at all ages, you know, people I know that have been to CIA or, or whatever it is, or FCI. But I think it was also just like financially, it was just like, look, I already four years of college, one year grad school. It's just like, look, you're just going to have to figure this out. The other way. So yeah, no, I honestly never really did. Sometimes I think about what that would have looked like. And you know, if I could redo things, would I do it the same way? But no, I just never. And I think I, you know, probably got some inadvertent advice from people just like, you know, some chefs would be like, just learn here. Like, what do you know? So no, it, it never did. If somebody in your kitchens today asked you, oh, I'm serious about doing this as a profession. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? It's a good question. It's difficult for me to say because I didn't go into culinary school. I would say no, personally. And here's why. And it's not, this is not a comment on culinary schools at large. I know relatively little about them. But I think 20 years ago, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the homogenous nature of restaurants was, it was more homogenous. So, you know, you had your fine dining, you had some steakhouses, maybe a few independents. The nature of restaurants now, especially in major markets or even mid markets, frankly, um, is so diverse that it's better to just think about what you want to do. 
before you make that decision. So culinary school, you know, as far as I understand, and you can look up the curriculum, you'll get basically a broad spectrum of technique, of cuisine, et cetera. But I think there's probably a relatively small percentage of that that will apply in the career that you take on. I think, for example, like say you you really, really want to do like ramen, like ramen or like, you know, izakaya style cooking, then just go do that. Because, you know, going to learn, you know, Bernays sauce and whatever, and obviously understanding the techniques and kind of the fundamentals behind a lot of things is important. But I think there's just the the nature of restaurants right now is too diverse. And there's just too many options to, to frankly justify spending the money. You know, if you want to get into sushi, go work at a good sushi restaurant Learn how to butcher fish really well. If you want to work at a steakhouse, go work at a steakhouse. And obviously you can change, but you know, I think education in general now is you could apply the same idea to education at large, like in college, just like there's just too many options. Like just figure out what you want to do. Going to read books about it for four years is, is beneficial. But I mean, look at me. I mean, I, you know, I took the LSAT twice. I mean, sniff law school. So yeah, that, that'd be my answer. I mean, look, I, I, again, I'm going to culinary school and I have friends that have um, one of my, my co-chef and his, his wife, all, you know, went to culinary school too. So, I, you know, again, I don't want to speak out of turn and, and having not done it, I don't want to say I'm unqualified to talk about it. But, you know, people do this thing where they say, oh, you know, everybody's self-taught. There, there's no real such thing as self-taught. Somebody taught you something. You know, I can say I'm self-taught, but my buddy Seth taught me how to cook meats to temp. You know, Christos taught me how to emulsify sauces. My my buddy Tyler taught me how to, you know, work a pasta station properly. You know, BJ, you know, has taught me immense amounts of things. So, you know, it, you learn what you want to learn and, and figure out how to apply it. And I think especially now, you know, with, with everything happening with COVID and kind of basically the compacting of the restaurant markets, um, it, it just seems, you know, I, I think you want to have your reasons before you go spend X amount of dollars on a culinary education. You want to do something very, you know, specific, then go do that. And a lot of kitchens now too do some, you know, such a diversity of food. You have restaurants that'll have, you know, raw proteins, pasta, meats cooked to temp. And so like, okay, see, so you're learning three, four different things in one kitchen and you're getting paid for it. That, that, that would be my, my short answer. And that was a long answer. So not really a short one at all. Now, at some point, too, you were also doing some freelance writing. You mentioned you were doing some of that and some photography and food blog and stuff. But you were actually writing for DCS.com, which is a pretty major publication in the D.C. area, you know, a blog website. You know, you have your Eater D.C. site. But I mean, that's that's probably one of the top five in terms of like food related content in the D.C. area. How did that opportunity just come about? I think that was probably in that kind of you know limbo period between, you know, me leaving corporate and also getting into food. You know, seriously, um, an Iron Gate. I've always liked writing. I enjoy writing. I, I you know, I, I do it a lot still to this day, and in various capacities. You know, for personal more than anything else. But uh, I, I think that was kind of at the point where I was like, okay, I want to be involved in food, but I'm not quite sure what capacity. So yeah, I did some articles for them. You know, nothing too major. I wrote a couple articles for um, the Edible DC chapter, I guess um, arm or wing, whatever you would call it, but. Uh, yeah. And then, so I, at the time I'd started kind of a mini little food blog, which I, I don't even think I can find anymore. I hope not. It's probably super embarrassing. Um, yeah, I started getting into, you know, that was when I started cooking more, you know, at home, you know, on weekends, my wife would be like, what are we doing this week? I'm like, well, I'm going to make this, this. And then she's like, okay, well, I get, at least I get a good meal out of it, even though you're just going to be in the kitchen all day. And I, I started doing a little more food photography. I, I, um, I think I bought a used digital camera, maybe um, was one of my dad's old ones. But, you know, era of food blogs, like, okay, like this could be a career path. It could be interesting, you know, could, you know, be a way to get noticed. And I, at, the, at the very least, it was just like, okay, cool. I get to like cook some stuff on my own time and in my own way. Yeah, that was actually, you know, sometimes I, even you, you mentioning, I forget about that sometimes. But yeah, that was fun. It, it was really fun. I got to do a couple cool little articles, you know, I think I did one where I like shadowed a chef at the farmer's market. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those people, for better or worse, it's always kind of thinking of like, you know, like a chapter two or a plan B. And so I'm like, hey, look, if this cooking thing doesn't work out, maybe I can do some writing. And obviously, the world of food writing has since exploded and also contracted in a lot of ways as well. So then you wind up at Rose's Luxury, which you said you staged at. Was that one of the places that you staged at and they offered you a job or did they not offer you a job or did you turn them down? And then how did you find your way back to join in the restaurant? They did not offer me a job. DJ, I'm still mad at you about that. But yeah, so yeah, when I was um, getting ready to leave corporate, I was like, okay, I'm going to go start at some restaurants. And this is actually a funny little side story. At the time, my, you know, Hannah, my girlfriend, actually, I, we actually got engaged literally. I think I've been at Iron Gate for two weeks. Um, so, you know, obviously, girl meets boy, start working at a restaurant for, you know, $13 an hour, good time to get engaged. So luckily, she said yes. And 
uh, she, she, we're still married to this day. But uh, yeah, I, I stashed at a bunch of places, including Iron Gate and Roses. And so Roses at the time was, you know, even though I, I didn't really process it in a larger way, blowing up. I mean, it was becoming like one of the first real restaurants in DC that was like shepherding the independent movement, you know, beyond um, kind of the old guard, I guess it is what I would describe it. My wife at the time had, you know, she's her brother, she's a twin, her twin brother, uh, Daniel had, I think he had sent us this thing. Hey, have you heard of this restaurant? Like it's actually run by, you know, one of the head chefs is a friend of his from high school. So long story short, there's like a weird connection there, but you know, it never really came through in a way where it's like, Oh, I really like get what's happening here. And so I stodged there really interesting kitchen. You know, I, I had only been in a handful, but a lot of them were a little more kind of like French style brigade, that sort of, and this was like guys in, you know, backwards hats, like doing just really savage technique, like really, really cool food. So I stopped there. I think I broke down like a case of guanciale for their amatriciana, cut myself, which is great. You always want to do that on a stage. You just look, you know, it's like, oh, great. Awesome. And they did, I think at the time they were doing two night stages. I think we did that most of the time I was there. Helped out in a pasta station. Then uh, BJ, uh, you know, Lieberman, you know, sat me down. I was like, hey, you did awesome tonight. We, you know, we, we'd love to bring you back for like a, a, a second stage just so we can work more closely and just kind of get to know you better. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So went back, you know, had a, you know, decent whatever. And then, um, you know, like a week later, you know, I followed up like, hey, I just wanted to check in, see if you guys are interested. Um, and, you know, email about, hey, really appreciate you coming in, but, you know, we just don't have a spot for you right now. And I was pretty bummed. I, I just like had a good vibe about it. But, you know, ended up at Iron Gate, which was, I mean, I mean, frankly, if you think about not just the food, but the two people I ended up meeting there is, you know, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. So, yeah, yeah, I got uh, I got declined, declined. And so um, I, I was pretty bummed about it. But, you know, nobody likes rejection in any format. But, uh, yeah, again, I think things work out the way they're supposed to. So how'd you wind up there then, you know, if they declined you, you know, the first time and, and then it kind of circles back, comes full circle and you wind up, you know, being on the line and eventually a sous chef there. How did you get in? Seth Wells, who was the, the sous chef at Iron Gate, um, again, by one of my closest friends and, and a significant mentor and impact in my life, um, left to go take a job as a cook at Roses, um, which, you know, for his level of talent, you know, I think it did to me that said, this restaurant must be serious because this guy's a beast. And he's going there just to like, you know, work cold station. That means it's, you know, they must be doing some real stuff over there. Um, so he left and, and, um, was replaced by a guy named James. Um, I forget his last name, but all, another amazing guy too. Who I, I didn't work with all that long. I, I think I saw him out one night, or I, you know, he came back to grab a beer with us, and uh, I was like, "Yeah, man, I I really wish I'd gotten that job at Roses." And he kept, you know, talking about, "Yeah, they do tastings every day. Like the food's like crazy. Like you know, he's just like a really cool experience. Like really tight run kitchen, and they're just like busy as hell every night." He's like, "I get destroyed." You know, he's an insane cook, so I mean, he can handle it. But uh, you know, I don't think he, you know spoke out of turn to anything wrong but you know i was just like yeah man i'd you know i'd i'd love to get back in there like if when my time's up at iron gate he's just like come stage and then i think uh he kind of dropped the line to me that you know bj was like yeah have him you know come back in and so i went to do another stage there unbeknownst to tony the chef at iron gate which you know i he tried lightly tried to do those things properly you know at the time i, I think i probably could have been a little more upfront about it um you know now i i kind of know think those things you try and be a little more transparent about your intentions but you know i went stage there had a good stage i was much more experienced so much more confident and just kind of understood like what my role was in that scenario and then you know i remember i, I popped out back at iron gate to drop some trash or i think hit the, the grease trap and i saw an email from bj he's like hey we'd uh we'd love to offer you a position here um you know give me a call when you can we can discuss details and i just freaked out i was like oh my god i'm so hyped i think i was in my time in Iron Gate had come to an end. I think I was kind of ready to to, to move on um, for various reasons, um, and also I just really wanted to work there. I was like, "This is this place is cool. Um, I like what they're doing. They're toast of the town. They're just the buzziest restaurant." I mean, I mean, frankly, in, like quite literally in America. I mean, at the time they'd gotten um, Bon Appetit, best restaurant in the country, all over lists. I mean, every list you read, they're just all over it. So you know, getting in the door there was was great, and and not only that, I was able to being able to follow Seth. You know, my friend and mentor was was a big deal to me i was just like i, I want to keep working with you i want to keep learning alongside and with you and so um yeah I, I was after about a year year and change at iron gate i ended up at roses that was kind of silverman's first restaurant that he opened there and, and it was really unique because not just did it bon appetit and, and i talked to bj about a bunch of that stuff on the podcast too but also some of the other stuff that i think a lot of people maybe don't realize that they kind of did and like you mentioned breaking down the old guard like 
they offer people health insurance, like time off, like other kind of corporate style, corporate workplace like benefits that normally restaurants just never had at that point. And now it's becoming kind of more commonplace. Like it's still not widespread throughout the industry, but it's definitely there's more places that do those style of things. So it was very on the cutting edge of kind of changing part of like the restaurant culture for sure. I forgot to ask BJ this when he was on the podcast, but were you there when Action Bronson came in and filmed? No, I, I think I, I was like right before I started. I've watched that. Yeah, no, I wish I was there. I mean, we we had some heavy hitters coming. I was like, I mean, it, look, my time at Roses cannot. I can't understate how important that is. I think Obama and his wife went there, right? For what was like his birthday or something. Yep, August eighth. Uh, I think so my birthday is August twelfth, and so that's like the pinnacle. I mean, it's. Uh, I remember one. Yeah. It, I just started. I mean, this is like two months after. So I was also working Cold Station, um, which is a two-man station at the time. Me and uh, my buddy Seamus were working there. They did like a, a, a back a front house pre-ship, but not so much front house. Or sorry, other way around. More front house pre-ship, but not necessarily back house. We did tastings, uh, but not like kind of like sit down and talk about like covers and stuff. Because especially then they take reservations. So it's just like, what are we? You know, we're, let's figure it out. We're probably going to be really busy tonight. But yeah, I remember, you know, Aaron kind of pulled everybody aside. was like, hey, we have to block off the back, you know, the, the basically the the back end of the dining room, back bar area, which probably had like, I think like four tables and then like a, a big communal style table in the back. We have a VIP coming tonight. And basically he was like, that's all I can say. And like, you know, he was very like tight lipped about it to the point where we're just like, okay, well, like, what's going on? And then we're sitting there. I remember one of the servers, uh, Thea, who is an amazing person came up. She's like, do you think it's Obama? And I was just like, I don't know. I mean, maybe he, she was like, I think it might be. And I was like, yeah, I guess his birthday is like right around this time. Because, I mean, it was a very, like, they were, you could, when you're, like, an hourly employee, as you kind of rise, you, you start to notice, like, when something's afoot. Like, you can see managers being, like, real, like, they just, like, tighten up real quick. And I was just like, what the hell is happening here? Barack Obama, when he was, you know, sitting president, came in with his wife and some friends from law school celebrated his birthday. We had, I mean, Secret Service was there. Um, they were standing literally right next to my station watching, you know, they were watching all the food get made. And I'm just like, I don't know what's more intimidating, like, having to, like, cook for, like, my chefs or... Secret Service watching me like not, you know, mess up this dessert. Super cool experience. You know, I didn't get to meet him directly. You know, you could see him. I mean, the energy was just insane. I mean, you know, BJ and I, I think, like took a picture with him and then he was super nice comments in the kitchen. Secret Service agents were actually super cool. Just like real chill. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have had some really cool experiences by virtue of my career. I mean, cooking for people. I mean, Gordon Ramsay came in, uh, Tom Colicchio and Andrew Zimmern. Jared Leto came in one night, which the servers were just losing it. But he like had a really weird diet, so we had to cook some like weird stuff for him. So yeah, Roses was um I mean at the time and it it was just hot. I mean, I think in the span I was there, um, I think I started right after they got Bon Appetit, best restaurant in the country. Um, I think and not long after I was there, four stars from Washington Post and their number one ranking, ton, you know, GQ, whatever, you name it, it was in there. And then I think right around the time when I started to work into to sous chef position was when uh, the you know, Michelin star, which, you know, was a huge deal. I mean, it was a huge deal. It just was. And, uh, and you can say what you want about Michelin stars and, you know, their impact and, and positive, negative. But, you know, at the time, like, look, you're cooking in a Michelin star restaurant. And uh, I think just before that, Aaron had won James Beard, best chef in Atlantic. So, you know, there was just like this rolling thing where things kept happening that just kept us busy. It was just like, okay, cool. We're getting blown up. And then another one, another one, another one. It's just like the amount of... That was probably... There was a lot of like really significant things that impacted my career at Roses. But I think the biggest thing was like learning how to just haul ass and prep your station because you almost couldn't be over prepped. It was almost impossible. You know, you have like some restaurants where it's like, hey, we got to throw that out. It's like, it just, it, it, it was impossible. Like you just couldn't, you couldn't have enough prep. There's nothing you could do where you would be over prepped because we were just that busy. I mean, and, and just, it was just insane. And just like, you know, AM, you know, prep was crazy and I was running that you know, that crew for a while. And just like the amount of like the walk-in turnover was insane. I mean, the orders I would put in, I'm just like, like, and they have thousand dollar orders on a Tuesday, just cause like, we just, yeah, we're that busy. That's just what's happening right now. Um, and so just even, you know, both as a cook, you know, from a station standpoint, from a prep standpoint, from a management, you just learn like to, you know, working in a really, really busy restaurant where like things are super dialed in because, you know, it was either right or it wasn't. I mean, you did, I got plates sent back all the time. Like it's broken. Roche looks terrible. Undercooked, overcooked, buy, buy, buy. I'm like, good God. But, you know, you're better for it. I mean, some of the people I came up with at our restaurant, I mean, I, I, they're just incredibly talented cooks. And we just learned how to be really, really fast, really, really quickly. And you just didn't have another choice. Give me your best 
working for BJ Lieberman's story from your time there? And I'll let you pick whatever direction you want to go with. Huh. That's a really good question. Well, okay. So it, it's not necessarily like a story, but it's more just like BJ at his core where he's just like, he's a really good expediter, but he'll just do like weird stuff. And like, so I remember I'd, I'd be working like the grill station, which uh, you, you know, I think we have the hangar stake at one time on carrots and he would just fire everything. Like he'd be like, yeah, just bring me 15. What? Just bring me 15 carrots. I'm like, like now? He's like, yeah, yeah, just, just go. Just go. He just set up the plates and he'd just be like, he's, he's just like, he, he has a very weird system. Like the way he, he talked, I mean, he basically is the person who taught me how to expedite, but like the way he does it is like, it's just sometimes you're just like, I, I can't bring you that much food right now. I was like, well, just, no, just go, just go. Yeah. I'll take, I might have to come back to that one. I mean, there's just so many. I'm just like, I, I mean, the man, you know, basically is you know, one of the more influential people in my professional career. So it's just like, do I embarrass him? Do I say something positive or just, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I might come back to that one. So after your time at Roses, I mean, you wind up moving back home to Cincy. How did that all come about? Because you wind up landing at Boca Restaurant Group, which is David Falk's restaurant group in Cincinnati. They have Boca, the restaurant, Soto, all the Nadas. There's like five. I think there's like five different Nadas. You know, how did you wind up returning back to, you know, Cincy, which was a place that really you never really planned on moving back to? Not at all. I, I thought I was never coming back here. Yeah, I mean, my time at Roses was was significant. I mean, I again, I worked every single station. I basically did every job in the restaurant, you know, beyond being you know the head chef. Um, just really influential. And like, you know, by the time I left there, I was just confident enough in my ability to you know be in a kitchen. I just be like, hey, I, day to day and strategically, I know what needs to happen. Obviously, you never stop learning. You never you know have enough knowledge. But uh, yeah, at the time, my wife and I got married. I, I don't know for some reason. Every inflection point of our relationship happens like right when I started a restaurant. Because we got engaged like two weeks after I started Iron Gate. And then we got married again, October 3rd, yesterday. And I started Roses in June. So we'd been like three months. I'm like, all right, I got to take off the wedding. It was like a, it was like a hurricane that week. It was an insane weekend. But um, it's actually funny because BJ's anniversary is literally quite exactly two weeks after mine. I remember October 17th. So happy anniversary almost to you and Bronwyn. Well, by the time this comes out, it'll be whatever. But, um, yeah, we just got to a point, you know, my wife's a teacher, um, you know, I was a cook and, you know, DC is an expensive city. And we we're just like, what, what do we, what's our long term here? Like, well, you know, am I going to open a place? Like, you know, her career path, she had specific things she wanted to start to do and explore. And um, we actually moved in with her parents. Like we were paying like two grand for an apartment, you know, one bedroom in Arlington. I was like, what are we doing here? We went to her parents' house for dinner one night and it was like you know, 10 minutes away. We're driving back. And I was like, yeah, what if we just like moved in with your parents? And we just like laughed and we got home. We're like, wait, no, what if we actually did do that? So, um, and so we went over for dinner, I think a couple weeks later and we were like kind of nervous to like approach them about it. They're like, her sister was in college, you know, her brother, you know, was living in, I think LA and he moved to LA by then. Um, so the house was empty and they were just like, okay, sure. I'm like, okay, cool. So we move in there, um, which was great. I mean, it was just, you know, Sunday dinner with, with the in-laws and really instrumental and you know, getting to know them better. I mean, there's no way to, you know, get to know your people better than living with them. You know, a lot of those relationships really developed during that time. It was just like a nice period of stability. But, you know, obviously it wasn't for forever. You know, we can, you know, again, 30 years old at the time we can't just stay here, have our family here. It's like, hey, we're just gonna hang out in your house till till you guys decide to to move on. But um yeah, it, it was interesting because we you know we just needed an end game. And so we were just like, are we really gonna go back into DC? Like, no, we're not really feeling it. Like we talked about yes, some other cities like Charlotte, Raleigh, because we you know we both went to Wake Forest. Um, and had, you know, love North Carolina. And then we've been coming back here a little more. I think when my dad and stepmom passed, that kind of precipitated a me coming back here more than I, you know, I, you know, I would just come visit more, just, you know, check out. I was like, okay, I need, you know, to be with the family more. My sister lives here and, and her husband and, you know, she had um, had um, her first son, my, my nephew, Jamie, by the time, you know, we really started going back. So we'd go visit. Yeah. You know, I remember one time we, we, we drove back here. We, we came up for, I think we went to a wedding in Cleveland, came back and, hung out here for a few days and drove back. And I was just like, you know, it's like a seven and a half hour drive. And probably toward the back third of it, we started talking about, you know, what was next for us. And I, you know, I was like, okay, should we, what about Cincinnati? You know, maybe we'd move there. Maybe that's a move. And she just freaked out, cried, like, sorry, babe, I love you. But she was, I mean, she'd lived almost with the exception of her four years of college and her one year in grad school, lived her entire life in that area. Her friends were there, her family was there. And so for me to just drop that bomb was just not... <laughs> It, I, I could have approached that more gently. Let's put it that way. I'm like, oh, let's move to Cincinnati. She's like, what? No, and just like lost it. Big fight. You know, we, you know, not a fight, but just we were just, I was just like, okay, well, like I, 
the process of us going from that conversation to actually moving here honestly probably took about a year and a half. I mean, I had really dropped that on the table. And then it was just a steady stream of conversations like, okay, what does it look like? What are we going to do when we get there? Where are we going to live? And for her, I mean, she's a fantastic, really, really good teacher. I mean, really one of the best of what she does. Um, so a lot of it was, you know, can her career continue there? I mean, you know, there's restaurants and schools in every city, put it that way. But, you know, are they Arlington County schools where she was working was really, really great school district. Um, and she really put in a lot of time there and developed you know, relationships professionally. Take that off the table is a big deal. And so, you know, you're married, like you, you make joint decisions. And so that's kind of where we arrived where it's like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this together. She was nervous about telling her parents they supported it. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, about three and change years after Roses and we'd lived in DC at that point, or I had almost nine years, we pulled the trigger and said, we're going to move back to Cincinnati. I moved to Cincinnati and, you know, my family couldn't have been more elated. And, you know, we're at the age where, you know, starting a family was on the, you know, not soon, but on the horizon. And look, I mean, if, if anybody who has kids, if you have family nearby, it makes it way easier. So we're like, look, we're either going to stay here. We're going to Cincinnati. We're going to like move to like Chicago where we don't really know anybody or, you know, LA where we're just going to be paying even more for less. So yeah, it was crazy. It was really just a, a really, it was a long decision. It wasn't something where it's like, yeah, we're going to move out tomorrow. It was like, it really strategic move in our life, I guess, is, is the, the best way I can describe it. How'd you wind up with Boca? Um, I mean, this, you know, that was, you know, the, the hot restaurant. A lot of it is, you know, my sister who's basically, she gave me all kind of the juice on the scene. Like I was like, I, I hadn't lived here, you know, since I was 17 or 18. So I didn't really know what was up. But there was, you know, Cincinnati was starting to get that new independent restaurant vibe. Like, you know, every city, it's a wave and it, it started to hit Cincinnati. I think that's actually a lot, a big part of what impact us moving back here. Cause we would come visit and go out with like my sister and her, you know, her husband. And it was just, you know, oh, this bar is cool. Like this like little cocktail bar. And then like this restaurant's cool. It's like gastropub thing. And it was just stuff that just didn't exist when I, when I grew up here. I mean, it, it just, it just wasn't here. I mean, you had your Jeff Ruby's, the precinct, you had a couple, you know, decent independent places, but it was, you know, by and large, more kind of old style French food, steakhouses. And so Boca was kind of like the, the hot, you know, French style restaurant beautiful interior, beautiful kitchen, badass staff. And it just seemed like the right fit for me. And I I think a big thing was I hadn't, up to that point my point in career, other than 1789, I hadn't done a lot of like brigade French style cooking. Um, And so that was like a gap. I was like, let me go challenge yourself with that. Like you can go work at the place that does like, you know, avant-garde hot dogs, but go learn to like work like a really hard roast station, entremet, stuff like that. So I guess, you know, for me, it was like plugging a hole in my resume or at least like trying something new that was like, okay, like I want to learn how to do this in a different environment. When did you know it was time for you to kind of go off and and do your own thing? I mean, you mentioned earlier, like you kind of started thinking about like, well, am I going to open my own place? And if it was going to be, you know, the DC area, Arlington, whatever, but you know, that kind of seed was probably already there. But when was it you knew like, all right, it's time. I really need to start looking into like, where am I going to open it? What space? What's the concept? Like all that stuff. So I actually, yeah, almost four years exactly. I started writing the business plan or at least drafting it for the restaurant in October 2017. So this was when I was still at Roses, still living uh, with my in-laws. Um, hadn't even, I, I don't think Cincinnati, I think we made the we, we made the call to, to move, but you know, we were like, it's going to be like six months. So um, cause we ended up moving here and I think spring, at least May 2018. I, I really don't know what prompted it, but I think a lot of it, I mean, frankly, was the economics of it. And okay, so you want to open a restaurant? Great. Awesome. But the economics of it in Cincinnati just makes so much more sense. You know, just like pure, just like, uh, does your, can you pay the rent? I mean, you know, DC, I mean, I, I respect the hell out of all the restaurateurs there and chefs and owners that are you're making it work. But I mean, it's really, I mean, it, it can get prohibitive almost to a point, you know, where it's so expensive, where it's like, how are we going to make this work? We were moving here, you know, mainly for personal reasons. I think my wife thinks like more personal. It's like for me, it's like, yeah, there's a little professional reasons too. So I can make this, you know, dream a reality. But yeah. I mean, I started drafting the business plan. I, you know, my father-in-law um, and my mother-in-law, actually they're lawyers by trade or ex-lawyers, you know, both retired now, but um, having that advice and that, you know, counsel for that sort of thing, just, you know, and just feeling like you're ready. I had no idea it would take this long. And obviously with COVID, you know, it, it's probably tacked on another year to, to the timeline, but uh yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of it was confidence and, you know, from, you know, people around me, but also frankly, my, my friends that I cook with. I mean, they, they're the best gauge of your ability. You know, these are people that I've been cooking with and working with day to day for, you know, like Seth and Christos for between Iron Gate and Roses four plus years. And, you know, you run it by them and say, Hey, I think I'm going to try, you know, I think I'm going to take a run at it. And you just trust your friends and family to be honest with you and say, either I, this is a good idea or a bad idea. And 
fortunately I was at a point where everybody around me was, you know, supported it. And, um, you know, my wife and obviously even still have tons of conversations about how, what does this mean for us long term? You know, that's where that, you know, that year of, of graduate business school, even though at the time was a very expensive way to delay reality, um, really came in handy because, you know, some of those skills I could tap back into to, to write this business plan. I mean, I drafted it completely from scratch, you know, wrote all the financials myself, like built spreadsheets. And, uh, you know, I think one of the first people that read it was my father in law. I mean, this, you know, this, you talking guys been in various aspects of, of law and corporate law for 30 years. And, you know, he gave me, you know, he gave me some feedback and felt good about it. And then, um, sent it, you know, to my sister and just some people close to me and just, you know, say, Hey, am I thinking about this the right way? Am I ready for this? Does this make sense? And getting the green light from the people that know you and, and care about you the most and, and want to support you was, was a huge deal for me. And, um, at the simultaneously, my sister hooked me up with a guy here who has become a close friend and we started talking about spaces and that's just how the train got rolling. And I look, it's like learning to walk, uh, you know, for a second time. Like, you know, I, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, this is my first time going through this process. So people ask me stuff. I'm like, look, I'm every day. There's something new that I figure out. And you think about, you know, people that have been you know, multiple units and it's just like, they probably started the same way. And you just, you walk pretty quickly and there's no run. There's just like, you just, take it as it comes. So yeah, it's just been an interesting process. And you know, knowing that, you know, I remember when I was getting ready to start the process, I actually sat down with Aaron um, Silverman, you know, on my way out of Roses and just kind of an exit talk. And uh, I asked him, I was like, Hey, do you, what do you think? I think I'm gonna start my own thing. He's like, do you want to do that? I said, yeah, He's like, then do it. Just, just do it. He's like, don't question it. He's like, trust me, like you, if you want to do this then commit to it fully. And I mean, he told me at the time, I remember, I think he said, from the day I decided I wanted to open Roses, it was three and a half years till we opened. Having that dose of reality actually has been really useful for me because sometimes, you know, I get impatient. I would, I just want, I want this to be ready. But, you know, knowing, you know, and I still you know, talk to Aaron and, and BJ sometimes too. They, you know, to who better to get advice from than people that have opened their own spots and run them um, well. The process is just crazy. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, one day, you know, maybe when I'm old and gray, I can reflect back on what it took to pull the trigger on that. But uh, it's been a crazy journey so far. And obviously, it's far from over. So, you know, you're working on, you know, your idea for a restaurant and everything. Then COVID kind of happens and just, I mean, it shuts everything down, puts everything on hold. And then you get this opportunity to where you can open up a pop up, you know, a restaurant near Finley Market closes and they kind of do this pop up series. Yeah, you do one of the pop ups and then they kind of like back and forth, kind of like, hey, you know, would you be interested in just kind of doing a continuous pop up? And that's kind of how you started Elm Street Social Club. Was that weird? Was it overwhelming at all? Like, because you're like running your own thing and it's a pop up, but like you're still kind of like, well, the restaurant's kind of on the back burner, but you're kind of still doing stuff for that. Or or how was kind of that experience? COVID hits. The timing of COVID, look, uh, the COVID thing is that you can't be overstated how impactful it's been for I mean everybody I'm sure for for you as well but uh when covid hit I mean I think I actually just done another pop up at a wine bar um the or, um, Oakley wine which is a fantastic wine bar here in Cincinnati and you know and the covid buzz was starting people were like hey is this, you know, what's going on like it's you know kind of kind of that I think everybody they look back and they think now like okay like that yeah that felt weird it was starting to feel like this might be a real thing Right around when COVID hit, I'd say we were probably six weeks from starting construction on the project, build out, pull the trigger on equipment, close out on our funding. I actually sent out my investor packet to like, uh, basically our, our investor documents to like, I think the day of the big first stock market crash, like dip. And I was just, I was like, let me, let me get that back. Sorry, guys. Let me, let me, can I unsend all of this from my email? Cause it's from a financial standpoint, this couldn't look worse. I was just like, this is brutal. But, you know, at the time, no one really knew what was really going to, you know, how serious it was going to get. And, you know, I had a conversation with my father-in-law. Um, he was like, hey, I think we really need to, like, put a hold on this. And, look, you need voice of reason sometimes because I wasn't ready to hear it. I was just like, look, let's full steam ahead. Let's keep going. And, you know, obviously, you know, my – ironically, so my wife's um, uncle is uh, – at the time and, and did, I think, a five-year contract stint as the CEO of the Four Seasons hotel chain. You know, so um, he's he's been a great kind of advisor to me in his understanding of hospitality. He's a amazing person. But basically he had, you know, told my father in law, you know, basically, hey, we're we're, you know, some of our resorts are, you know, fully shutting down. Um, which, you know, to me and and to us was like, that's a sign that this if something that prominent, that some something that focused on hospitality is closing, that probably means um something real is happening. So we put the project on hold and actually I got a call from from the landlord, our developer, said the same thing. It was hey, we should we should shelve this and uh 
it was weird. My wife was two months pregnant. I'm like, oh, okay, this is. And then, you know, you just go pick up a case of wine and then hunker down for however many months that ended up being. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, the summer started to ease up a little bit. I think, it, you know, because people could be outside. I think the numbers dipped. And so we, I did a pop up at, um, what was then called, really can't even remember the name of it. It's this 18, 19 month street. I, I apologize to all the people that, that run Finley Market for not remembering the name of it, but, uh, I did a pop up there. It was super fun, you know, a little trepidation with COVID, but it went off, you know, really well. Um, and then they approached me and said, you know, would you want to take over the space, you know, on a kind of a, a short term basis? And, uh, at the time, uh, I just needed something to do. I mean, I just really wanted to keep the momentum going. Our exposure had died so significantly. You know, the hype for, you know, our, our main project was just kind of on hold. So I took the opportunity. Um, and around the exact same time, my friends, Mikey, um, who's, you know, like basically our head chef, um, and his wife, Willow, who's essentially our pastry chef and jack of all trades beyond belief, they had entered a weird situation in DC where the restaurant they were working out was basically crashing for, COVID, but also other reasons. And, you know, they put a lot of time and energy into to, to that concept um, from a managerial standpoint. And they were like, you know, we, what do you think about us moving up there? And uh, Willis uh, and Uncle actually live across the river in Covington. Um, and they'd been up here a few times before. So the timing was just right. You know, not only did I get this opportunity, but also I had two people coming to run it with me that I love and trust very much. So um, yeah, we conceptualized Elm Street Social Club. I mean, a lot of it was driven by, you know, something fun. I mean, sandwiches, we were like, what What doesn't really exist in this market? Just like an independent sandwich shop, homage to like delis and bodegas and, you know, 80s throwback. And I think it was at the time COVID, everything was so heavy and just, you know, especially kind of the larger, you know, frankly, just, you know, sociopolitical environment too. Really, let's just do something fun, bright colors, you know, something where people, it just makes people feel good. Like nothing heavy handed, you know, our, our logo was like blue and, and yellow and and. Um, just a lot of kind of nostalgia and making it feel like, you know, some throwback. And, and I, it was it was super fun. It was hard, but it was fun. I think it was the social OTR space, right? Yes. That was, I, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't remember the name of it. Do you think the delays that you encountered with COVID, were they a good thing? Did they help like for preparation, refinement of the aperture? Or do you think it was bad just due to, I mean, you avoided mostly, you know, heavy construction costs because everything got put on hold ahead. But still, there's, you know, dollar costs, anxiousness, just like, am I still going to be able to follow through with this? Are people going to back out now? Like, I mean, I'll say several things on that. I think one, nobody, nobody could objectively look at COVID and say it was positive just at a high level. There are things that have come out of it and will come out of it that I think in the long term will lead to, to positives. And that's the way I try and look at it. Look, when, when we had to shut the project down, I was despondent. I was just like, I mean, I was fully committed. I mean, this is the next big step for my wife and I and I, as a family and, you know, my, my family at large. I mean, a lot of people have, had supported it and still, still are supporting it. But um, the Elm Street Social Club thing was uh, as difficult as it was. It was really instrumental because it was the first time I had to run an operation. Now, I've been a sous chef at, at, at a few places. You know, you've been a part of a team running the kitchen and the restaurant. But when everything goes through you, even in a small pop standpoint, we were a four person team. I mean, we ended up hiring another guy, Ben, um, who's, who's coming on with us at the Aperture as well. It's just different. I mean, it's different. You know, I'm, you know you're writing the checks. And so it was kind of like a crash course and in, in a graduate school running your own operation. I mean, it's just different when it's, it's, it's your money. You know, people are counting on you. You're making the decisions that, are going to make or break the concept, you know, just, you know, food wise, business wise, and also with COVID, how are you keeping people safe? And so we were pretty significantly focused, the takeout aspect of it. And I think that gave us confidence to run it safely. You know, we explored doing some, some in-house dining and it, but it's never came to fruition, especially once the winter hit and numbers started to spike again. But um, the things that I learned running Elm Street social club were, were, have been massive. I mean, I've taken copious notes on, what did I learn? Like, what does it mean to run a business beyond just being like sous chef and expediting and ordering? It's like, you know, how do you take it to a high level? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how cool your food is, your concept is, if you can't make money off of it, it just doesn't. That It's largely irrelevant. You can have the best concept and menu in the world. But if you're, you know, bringing people in the door and the dollars don't work right, then it, it just doesn't matter. So with, with, with the Aperture, I mean, a lot of it, yeah, I think um, COVID gave us a chance to start working as a team. You know, these are people, you know, Mikey and Will I've known for a long time, but to work in a close capacity is just different. Gain exposure, gain trust in what you're going to do. And also, COVID obviously exposed a lot of things about the industry that, you know, people, I think, you know, behind the scenes have known for a long time, but, you know, needed to come out and 
you can read any article you want about, you know, things that have, have developed in the industry, things that need to be fixed. And so for me, the refinement of the concept is significant. And so how do we, you know, focus on bringing the aperture to life, staying true to its intentions, but also understanding that the environment's changed. Labor, I think, you know, obviously is a massive problem right now. So how do we make it realistic to run the operation knowing that labor might be a little more constricted than it was, but also how do we shepherd change with, you know, with the restaurant? How do we make this a sustainable place, not just for customers and for the, you know, the, the income statement, the P&L, but also for the people that work there, you know, work-life balance. How do we make this a place that people not only want to eat at, but want to work out and can leave feeling knowing that they supported a business that frankly just is doing things the right way. So a lot of my thinking and what I've been doing, you know, and talking about, you know, internally and we'll start talking about as a team isn't just the food and the wine and the service, but also like, what does this look like to, to be a good restaurant for people to work at um, from the managerial level down? That's hard. I mean, it's a really hard thing because, you know, you, you have to internally break some of the habits mentally that you might have gained coming up in other restaurants. And that's not a comment on anything specific or anything that's happened or, or we witnessed, but it's just, it's a matter of fact that, you know, restaurant industry is going to go through and is going through some serious growing pains. And so we need to be a part of that. You know, on the on the back end of this, the hope is that people are still really excited to dine out. Um, they really want to keep going out and experiencing that. I mean, for most people, frankly, it's a it's the primary form of entertainment. I mean, if you were asked people in a given year how many times you go out to a restaurant versus going to like a movie or a show or a concert, it's probably not even close. But you know, uh, conceptually, I think we still know what we want to be. But you know, how does that manifest internally? So how do we? We basically the way I always put it to people is I want to be we want the restaurant to be known not just for what it does but how it does it. So the the how is just as important, and that you know that's making sure people are compensated correctly, health insurance, time off, benefits. Like it's just Elm Street was difficult for me. Like I burned myself out super hard, and I there's things I could have done better. But knowing how that felt is instrumental to the fact that I don't ever want anybody else to have to feel that way. And it doesn't matter if they're the head chef, the CDC, or a part-time server. They just can't function in the way that makes people feel like they dread going to work. I mean, that's just the worst feeling in the world. No one else. Yeah, that, that's the best way I can put it. I know that's kind of a roundabout answer. But uh, yeah, it's given a lot of time to think. And now that, you know, I'm sure, you know, maybe we'll talk about the timeline. But, you know, we're about to start, you know, construction soon. And so therefore, the planning stage will really start. And so as a team, you know, the early conversations... Honestly, won't have anything to do with food. We'll get to the food. We know what we're capable of cooking, but like, let's make this a concept that's sustainable for us as a management team and for our employees. And so, for example, I think we'll probably have our first um, management team meeting probably, you know, November in the fall. And the first thing I want everybody to do is tell me everything and we'll write it on a whiteboard or whatever it is, everything that you disliked about working in restaurants. And let's find ways to fix that if we can. Look, there's some realities where it's like, yeah, sometimes it's going to be a rough service. Or like, you know, you get your ass kicked on a station, that's just going to happen. But, you know, how do we balance that out? And, and that's really what I want to be focused on. Because I want it to be a place that people are proud to work at. And it's not just because of the food and the wine, but because it's, it's a good place to work. Where's the name come from? Uh, photography. So my, one of my uh, main hobbies is um, I shoot film between having a one-year-old and planning a restaurant. I'll have as much time to do it as I, I wish I did. But uh, in optics, basically, the aperture, you know, we have one in our eye, everything visual has... It's basically what lets light in. Um, so if you like, were to take a film camera and the aperture is is basically what opens and closes to, you know, depending on you know, your settings, how bright, how dark, you know, what time of day it is, etc. cetera. Um, and so the name is, is really focused on illumination and making people feel warm. So the name is really focused on... Um, that feeling of letting light in, like it's, you know, how do you feel like making people feel good? And and again, that goes back to not just the guests, but employees and anybody that walks in the door, whether it's somebody doing a wine delivery, a food delivery, you know, a purveyor, it's like, hey, people, I want people to leave this building feeling good, whether they're tired or not. Um, and so it's about, you know, illumination and making things a little brighter, um, even if somebody's, you know, having a bad day. You know, now that construction is starting to begin, like opening time frame, obviously, there's there probably will be some construction delays. There always are, right? When do you think roughly now looking at everything like your timeline for opening and, and going through all the, the rest of the steps of the process to opening? If I had a nickel for every time I had to answer this question, trust me, I, I do it internally every day. But we're probably looking, I think, uh, late spring of next year. You know, our, our build out timeline, it, look, it's an aggressive build out. It's an ambitious restaurant. I mean, it's a you know, a lot of things we're doing in there that, you know, it's in a fully open kitchen. Equipment timelines are insane right now. Um, I 
can't get a walk in for four months, even if I wanted to. But yeah, we're probably looking at, you know, basically a five and a half build out process, five and a half months. Um, then we're looking at probably opening um, probably late spring of next year. I think that's the most realistic timeline. That's not best case scenario, but also not worst case scenario. It's kind of like in the middle. So it could be sooner, but the call could be later. So we'll see. I mean, we got to put in a wood fire grill and hoods and, and stuff like that. So it's it's an aggressive and ambitious build out, especially for my first restaurant. But, you know, we really want to make a splash. I mean, we, we want it to be a, a really, really... Our space is very prominent and, and the developers have put a lot of faith in us. I mean, it's really kind of the cornerstone of a, an emerging neighborhood. I mean, really like the quite literally the, the cornerstone of the neighborhood. So, um, you know, we really... Timelines are difficult, but, but you know, what do we always say is we'd rather do it right than fast. Because your restaurant's going to be in Walnut Hills. It's not going to be in the OTR where everybody else is. Is Walnut Hills the next area kind of targeted for development? Because you have the banks, you have OTR, like those two are pretty, you know, even around Finley Market is kind of being redeveloped now and, and everything. Is Walnut Hills kind of the next area? I think so. I mean, yeah, I think it's, you know, look, I, where our space is and we're it's only a five, six minute drive from OTR. So what I'll say about Walnut Hills, what I like is it's accessible from all points. You know, it's easy to get to, you know, highways right there. There's you know, not only um, Model Group, who's who's our landlord and developer, putting a lot of energy into that neighborhood. I mean, a lot of mixed use developments and the proximity to a lot of other things happening. So, for example, um, the UC Hospital System um, in campus is is only like I think three four minute drive. East Walnut Hills is adjacent, and a lot happening there. Yeah, I think you know OTR is fantastic. It's a really really great. I think people are hungry for kind of what the next thing is. And I think a lot of what I enjoy about Walnut Hills um, is that a lot of thought has gone into it in terms of how do we make this kind of an all day neighborhood, you know, where you get coffee, breakfast, lunch, aperture for dinner, esoteric brewings right next to us, if, you know, grab drinks, several really fantastic cocktail bars, a wine retail store is going right up the street. Um, the owners of Pleasantry, which is a great, great restaurant here, Dan and Joanna and their team are putting a new wine shop up there. So the diversity of it, I think is really positive and really is what we're looking forward to. And almost the best part is, is there's residential because at the end of the day, you know, if you think of like us, you know, as a restaurant or Comfort Station, which is a fantastic cocktail bar, esoteric brewing right next to us, great brewery. Your Fridays and Saturdays, you know, those those should be easy. You know, what I mean that that should you know if you make if you're not busy on a Friday Saturday, you have, you have bigger problems. But it's that 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 Monday through Thursday, and so having all that residential there is really going to be fantastic. And so, kind of going back to your earlier question about the concept and how we've you know started thinking about it, is like how do we make this a restaurant that people can go in on a Tuesday and feel like that's like a good Tuesday dinner? So. A lot of it boils down to price point, approachability, menu style. But um, it, yeah, I think it's really great. I think it'll be you know both a combination destination neighborhood, but also a neighborhood in and of itself that's kind of sustainable. You know, on that Sunday through Thursday. So yeah, we're really excited. I mean, it's the opportunity, the space presented to us, and the way that it fell into our lap is very fortuitous and really fantastic. And it's a great space. Like we we feel a lot of responsibility to. You really shepherd in the neighborhood. I mean, the space itself is very prominent and we really want to be kind of a shining spot on that corner. Are you still going down the path with the food style kind of being American South Mediterranean or do you think that might change by the time or? No, I really don't see it changing. I think a lot of it will be more the focus of how to make our menu sustainable from like a labor standpoint, if that makes sense. Food costs. Yeah, and just not, you know, stuff that takes, you know, an army of cooks to prep and, and execute just because, look, frankly, you just might not be able to find that. Like if you're always sweating it out looking for cooks and, and servers and bartenders, then that's just a tough world to live in. But uh, no, I, we really, I think we're going to stay in that box. I mean, really simple, simple, simple. I mean, everything is, you know, I have this, I have this thing where, you know, I used to be doing a lot of pop ups and private dinners and I'd be, you know, planning menus at home and I would tell my wife, if I start the, saying the phrase, you know what would be cool on a dish, that probably means I've taken it too far. Um, it means like there's probably one or too many components or like you're getting a little too wild with it. So she knows that that's when it's it's time for me to, to dial it back. She's like, okay, but do you really need to do that? And 99% of the time she's right. So yeah, I mean, a lot of it is hyper simple. And, and, and a big thing too is there's so many fantastic farms and producers in this area, you know, Kentucky, Indiana, it's so many, you know, farmers and, and and people that I've met, butchers. So we want to tap into that. We want to, you know, keep the menu flexible enough that if we find a cool product, we can just throw it on. That's something where, you know, there's like a two-month R&D cycle for a dish. Um, same with wine. 
you know, same with wine. There's a lot of great wine purveyors here, people, you know, stewards of wine, psalms. And I think that's kind of the name of the game for us is keep it small and flexible. I mean, at any given point, the menu, I don't want it to have more than 12 to 13 savory dishes on it. Anything beyond that, I think is too much. Same with the wine menu. It's like if somebody drops off a cool case, cool, let's do it. You know, nothing where we have to think too hard about it, make our, you know, we obviously want to taste everything, but it's kind of, you know, as I said earlier, you know, to Iron Gate, when I worked there, it's, it's the way the food will probably operate is like the work will be done behind the scenes, but what's the table will probably be hyper simple. And we want it to be something where you can come in, you know, with, you know, your whole you know crew, you know, six top and whole menu blow it out, or you can come in and grab a glass of wine and a plate and be out the door for, you know, 25 bucks. Having been in Cincinnati for the last few years, working in there and visiting before that too. Why do you think Cincinnati is so overlooked in the hierarchy of great food cities? You know, it's, you know, I'm here in Columbus. I'm a big fan of the food scene in Cincinnati, a lot of chef driven restaurants, independent restaurants, but it still doesn't seem to get the recognition maybe that it deserves on a more national scale. You know, it feels like it's in Columbus's shadow in a way, which it kind of shouldn't be. It probably should be the other way around. We have some great restaurants here and, and we've had some people on the podcast too. But but I think when you get to the kind of the, if you want to call it middle tier, or you know maybe they're not the super blown out, high concept, you know, tasty menu restaurants, but you, you can walk down the street in the OTR and you can just pop into a place. It's probably going to be amazing. Where here in Columbus, we don't have that kind of dining district. You know, we have stretches of Bethel Road where it's got a lot of, ethnic food, which is all great and stuff too. But why do you think, you know, Cincinnati just hasn't gotten like, it's kind of like it's due? It's a good question. It's actually funny you say that because what I'm interested to see is on the heels of COVID, where food media goes, obviously a lot of it's kind of, you know, there's nothing to write about, you know, for you know half of last year. I think a lot of it for Cincinnati is Cincinnati just doesn't ask for attention, if that makes sense. And I, I don't, you know, that's not a negative. I mean, you know, New York, San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, they speak for themselves, you know, DC. I've always said, I mean this in the most positive way. I, the best way to describe Cincinnati is that I think it's a blue collar city disguised as a white collar city. One of the reasons I wanted to move back here, I was, I was more excited to move back here than I thought I would be because it's just such a community driven city. I mean, a lot of places say it's like, yeah, we're community, but like DC, for example, is so transient. I moved there. There were like 25 of my friends from college. We're all gone. Almost all of us. One of them, my buddy's about to move soon. And that's not a common on DC, but it's just like, you know, Cincinnati is, people make fun of it sometimes. It's like, oh, people just, you know, they grow up here and they never leave. But there's something positive about that too, um, where it's a truly grassroots city. I mean, it really is. Um, a lot of homegrown people, concepts, businesses, and people support it. Um, why hasn't it got attention? I, I really don't know. And I think I, with the aperture, I think that's something we kind of want to seek. I, you know, I don't think it's positive to seek fame. I don't, you know, I think it, it's more of a result of just doing well at what you're, you're good at. I mean, I'm hoping that we can draw attention enough, not just to us, but to just the city in general. It's like, hey, you know, go to Comfort Station. They have fant- homemakers, Longfellow, fantastic cocktails. Go hit Oakley Wine or the Rhine for, for wine. Like, go hit any one of the absolutely fantastic breweries here. And it's actually funny because, you know, I, you know, we have a good amount of friends, my wife and I, that aren't from here. San Francisco, they'll visit. Boston, Chicago. DC, whatever, LA. And every time we have people come here, you know, we show them around. They're like, man, Cincinnati's really cool. It's a beautiful city. The architecture is insane. It's really unique. And I think it'll have its due. And, and, and I think a lot of it is not to get into a larger conversation driven by the fact that, I mean, I don't think it's any secret that between COVID, cost of living, a lot of people are starting to move from other cities. Like the coasts are kind of, you know, people starting to move away. And so what I actually find super interesting in Cincinnati is, you know, when I was younger, most people you met were from here. You might get somebody from Columbus or Cleveland and move down or maybe Chicago, Indianapolis. But there's more and more people coming here from other cities, you know, New York, like people literally moving from these high tier, you know, highly desired places to live that are not coming to Cincinnati. I think that's fantastic for not just the food and beverage scene, but for the city in general, because it's an influx of people that going to bring new ideas and experiences and it's just going to meld with everything. And I think that plus the community driven nature of the city is just really going to be positive. And look, at the end of the day, you need people to keep your restaurants busy. And I think what Cincinnati has that people don't think about is a lot of it's a city that you can afford to live in, but also afford to have fun in because it's cool to live in New York or, you know, DC. And I mean, my wife and I encounter that where, hey, it's you can have all the amenities in the world, but if you can't afford to, to enjoy them, then what's the point? I think Cincinnati and, you know, other mid-tier cities too, Columbus, Kansas City, I think is, is kind of on that radar too. You know, it's the same thing that happened in probably like the, like, 
pre and maybe a little bit post Great Recession, where that's when you saw Austin, Nashville, Portland, those cities started to explode. And now they're frankly not much cheaper than, you know, your, your New York's and Boston's and DC's. That wave is going to come for another tier of cities. It's just you know, a question of what they're going to be. But I mean, I think, you know, Cincinnati and Columbus, Indianapolis, I, I think, you know, Kansas City, um, Oklahoma City, you know, you see these, these places that, you know, people kind of wrote off, but then, you know, you move to Cincinnati and you, you can work for P&G or Cintas and there's, there's businesses here. Same with Columbus. You know, you can work, you know, at, you know, Wexler or whatever it is. So I think that's honestly, I mean, I know that's more kind of a strategic answer to your question, but I actually do think on the heels of COVID and just kind of people understanding, getting a better sense of work life balance and what they want out of life. Cincinnati's housing market was one of the fastest growing in the country for months and months on end. And I don't think that's a mis, I think you could understand why. And I think it's really going to start to explode the city. Um, but I think the beautiful thing about Cincinnati is that the growth is always going to be protected by the community. It's not just going to be big body developers. You know, you know, there's a reason why you don't see chains in OTR. Uh, you don't see chains, you know, eh, I think that's a positive thing. And I think it's, uh, it'll be fun. I think it's gonna be fun to see. We're excited to be a part of it. Um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, be a positive part of it. But I think, yeah, to answer your question, I, I don't know why. I think people, because people don't ask for it. I think Cincinnati just wants to, we're just here. I mean, we're, we're happy with what we have. And, I, you know, nobody's nobody's going out to see Michelin stars, even if they, they were available. I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. We're, we're fine. This question comes from James Ray Ray Anderson. He's the chef owner of uh, Ray Ray's Hog Pit, Meat and Three here to up in Columbus. He was a previous guest on the podcast. Uh, we always have everybody leave behind a question for the next guest. His question that he left behind, what is your favorite ingredient to work with when it comes to cooking? I'm going to give a combo answer because it's sort of the same thing. Fish sauce and anchovies. People would be surprised at how much fish sauces and things I like cook just because it just, the salt and the funk is just something you can't really get in other places. You, know, you can salt things all day, but like a little bit of fish sauce will take it to a different level. Um, same with anchovies. For example, like my Pomodoro sauce um, recipe that, you know, that we're really proud of, um, there's anchovies in the base. I mean, we can make it without it if it's a vegetarian scenario, but I think those two, like if I, if I have those two at my disposal, then I, it makes life a lot easier. What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? And it can be anything. All right. I like going like pretty hypothetical. I call them dinner party questions. Sorry, this is a little bit of a long one, but you can shorten it as needed. You can build a house anywhere in the world. Your dream, dream house, compound, whatever it is. All the amenities, anything you could ever want. Beautiful kitchen, tennis courts, pool, whatever. But you cannot leave ever the surrounding 30 mile radius. Where do you build a house? So we got a handful of more questions for you. We ask these to everybody who comes on the podcast. So everybody gets kind of a compare and contrast across all the episodes. Who would you say is the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far? Looking back on it. Seth Wells, currently the culinary director of Rose's Restaurant Group. I love you, Seth. Thank you. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Offset spatula. One thing in a restaurant that you would not fix yourself. This thing breaks. You're calling somebody. You don't care what it costs. You're like, I'm not messing with that. Oh, everything. I hate fixing things. Yeah, I'm going to be the worst restaurant owner ever. I got it. BJ's like the exact opposite. He'll like, they'll get in everything and fix it. I just can't. I hate fixing stuff. Dishwasher. If your dishwasher goes down, your life is, your life is done. Restaurant you'd recommend that isn't your own. The scenario I usually give is person gets stuck at the, the airport, for like it's canceled. They're stuck overnight, reaches out to you. Hey, you know, I'm stuck in town. Where should I go eat? You guys are closed. You point on this direction. I'm actually going to, this is going to be an interesting answer. It's called a deep A D E E P India, super just hole in the wall, Indian restaurant in Clifton by right by UC. It's so good. I think we're ordering it tonight because, well, I just made that decision. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It's so good. A deep India Clifton. I mean, there's some great restaurants here, but if you're talking like just some comfort, like just savagely good Indian food, Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant, place you haven't been that you want to go to, place you haven't been, but you definitely want to eat. Bucket list travel is, I'll just say Japan. I can't really pick a city. I'm, I'm hoping the next two, three years to make that trip. Bucket list restaurant, either Blue Hill, Stone Barns, or Manresa in uh, Los Gatos. Probably Manresa, just because I think the setting is ridiculous. Um, but the best meal I've ever had, respect to all the restaurants I've eaten, it was Smith in Chicago, SM, SMYTH. John Shields, Karen Shields. It's uh, I did so basically right after this is a small story. Right after I left Roses, we lived at my in laws for a while, and we you know saved a good amount of money. So I by dream and I had to run this by my wife and mother and sister like eighty times. I went on a road trip by myself for thirty one days, basically from D C all the way out to the West Coast and then back. Stopped in Chicago um, and had a twelve course 
with pairings that Smith and Chicago best meal I've ever had is incredible. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? I mean, I've seen some rough cuts, but that's I, those are gross. Um, I never saw it, but at Rose's, apparently, when the fried chicken was on the menu permanently, they actually had to change the fryer during service, which is, if you know anything about fryers, is a ridiculous task. But I will say, saw a guy once, shout out to Ben Weehaw, pureeing um, sun gold tomato sauce, basically sun gold pasta sauce and, a, and Vitamix. And I really don't know what happened, but it just started spraying everywhere out of the bottom. Like literally, so I, I, I don't know, the, the bottom got disconnected or like the screw came loose, but I, it just got everywhere. And it just literally was like almost like somebody like had a hose of sun gold tomato sauce and just got everywhere. He was so mad, but it was really funny. Food or drink guilty pleasure. Is there anything that, whether it's fast food or if you're in the grocery store, you know, you're trying to stay away from this aisle because you know that thing's down there. Just can't help yourself. Grocery store, I'm not, I'm not like a snacker. I'm like a kind of three squares a day type guy. I love Taco Bell more than anything in this world. And I don't care what anybody says. It's so good. Sometimes I'll like get it and just like hide the wrappers from my wife, like stuff in the trash. And she'll be like, you got Taco Bell? Like, yeah, I'm sorry. That or I will say the other two things, fried calamari and Caesar salads. I've eaten so many bad versions of those just because I can't say no. If, if I see fried calamari on the menu in any version, I'm getting it. It could be at, like the worst restaurant in the world. I'm like, I'll try it, whatever. I have to ask this because I asked this to Brian Baxter when he was on and he had Taco Bell as his answer too. What is your order? Oh, God. Sorry to anybody listening to this. This is going to be gross. Two Supreme Beef Chalupas, two Supreme Crunchy Tacos, one Steak Quesadilla, and depending on how I'm feeling, a Crunch Wrap Supreme, and lots and lots of fire sauce. And yes, I'll eat it all. Favorite dish thing that you ever cooked, created, kind of looking back on your career, you can kind of point to this dish being your aha moment. Like you knew you could for sure do this professionally, you know, as your career. Probably my, the, the recipe, and I, I'm actually really protective over it because it's really good. I developed a really, really good Thai curry recipe. It, khao soy is, is basically like kind of like the, uh, not the national dish of Thailand, but it's like a very common dish. My wife and I actually went there for a honeymoon. Basically like a noodle soup with like a red curry broth and then crispy noodles, usually with chicken and lime. Um, the recipe I've developed for that is, is it doesn't miss. It's very good. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. It's like 20, like 16 things in it. It's really annoying to make, but um, it's extremely, extremely good. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan. Not everybody is. If you were, is there a episode moment scene that stands out about him to you the most? Or if you weren't, is there somebody else who was like a culinary personality, somebody that was kind of like on TV in the public eye when you were coming up that you always kind of gravitated towards, you know, whether it be like Emerald or... No, nah, I'm, I'm Bourdain through and through. I just literally, I remember sitting in my, I was on my way to work at Boca when my mom called me and told me he died. And I, I cried in my car. Like I was, it was a really bummed out day for me. I, I'm like horrible because I get multi-part answers. So I apologize for that. So I'll say on his old show, No Reservations, he did an episode where he went back to Lay All, his old restaurant and did a shift and Aaron Prayer came with him. I, I would actually watch that episode to get hyped up for stages. That was my like hype episode. And this is the lamest thing ever, but I would watch it be like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And then I would obviously not go do it in New York. Parts Unknown, there's, there's so many good ones. The one that's sort of near and dear to my heart is the Thailand episode where he's in Chiang Mai. And I'll tell you why. My wife and I went to Thailand for a honeymoon. We um, did a few days in Bangkok. We did uh, Chiang Mai and then uh, Koh Samui. But in Chiang Mai, if you watch the episode, him and Andy Ricker go to um, essentially a drag show in Thailand, which are very popular, very super fun. I mean, we near Anarsan Market, um, which is this awesome, it was like food hall. We had like a ton of food. And then we were like, oh, let's go. I, I've seen this episode 20 times. We know exactly where it is. It's right there. We got to go. So we get tickets. Um, we go to the show, sit there. And, and it's mostly Western, you know, like American, like Australian, you know, European guys. And obviously, you can imagine I, I stand out like a sore thumb in Thailand. Anyway, so the reason the episode is near and dear to my heart is because we went to the exact same drag show that, that Andy Ricker and uh, Anthony Bourdain went to. But what we didn't know is they do a part of the show where um, they find people in the audience and pull them on stage. I get picked out of the crowd with like three or four other guys. They take you to this back room. You see all the performers and they're like their dressing room. They give you like a cocktail. Who knows? I could have been anything in that cocktail. I just was like, sure, great, awesome. And then they put me in a pink dress and a blonde wig and I went and danced on stage with four or five other guys. I think one of them was America. Actually, yeah, I think one of them was like from like Chicago or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's why that episode means a lot to me. There are pictures of that happening. No one will ever see them. My wife has them under lock and key by pain of death. No one will ever see those pictures. Where can people find you? Social media, website, restaurant website, all that stuff. Plug everything. 
Yeah, uh, we got, um, so the apertureCNC.com is our website. It's kind of a landing page right now, giving some info. I actually need to do some work on it to start to update it um, now that we're kind of getting into the meat and potatoes of things. Instagram handle, same, the aperture C C I N C I. But that's our Instagram tag. Not a lot of content there, but again, we're about to fire it up. We actually work with a company um, based out of New York called Oyster Sunday, um, which is the independent restaurant consulting uh, run by Elizabeth Tilden and uh, Jess. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, any independent restaurant tours out there, I highly recommend contacting them for multiple needs. Um, and then my personal Instagram is J E Anthony Brown. Not a lot on there right now. Just a couple of pictures of my kid. And uh, yeah, we uh, we're, we're getting into the fun stages of the project. Finally, I'm excited to start like really working with the team, and I'm sure I'll have to have some construction headaches. But uh, like I said, I started running the business plan in October 2017, so this is a long time coming. Well, like I said, we got the chance to eat at the pop up you did up here, and it was amazing food. Can't wait to see kind of the full menu and and the build out and everything you got planned. Super excited. I mean, we we try and get down to Cincinnati as much as possible. To it's only 90 minutes from here, so you can go down eat. And, and drive back to you don't yeah you don't always have to stay so so yeah it'll definitely be a place that i'm sure will be one of the first people uh as soon as you open the reservation books for it and everything but open invitation anytime come back on the podcast doesn't always have to be an hour or hour and a half or anything if it's a new menu or before you guys open and you want to plug it talk about it whatever um we always want to support everybody who supports us by coming on the podcast so definitely looking forward to the aperture coming to fruition and fully opening and and everything that kind of you're working on and you got in store seeing it we're excited i appreciate uh you having me on this has been fun first of all i listen to a ton of podcasts i was actually listening to one this morning i'm like i hope i don't sound stupid on this thing so yeah this has been super fun um really excited a lot of exciting things happening in cincinnati yeah i just it's, yeah people best kept secret you know there's half of you that wants to keep it that way there's uh, happy that wants you know other people to find out about it, but you know we're fortunate to be a part of the community and we're excited to to get to work. I'm sure uh, I'll be sleeping in the basement at my restaurant <laughs> next year a lot. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. This has been super fun. A big thanks again to Jordan for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of his day off just to chat about his career and where the aperture is and where it's headed and all the different kind of stresses and pain points of getting ready to open a restaurant in a post-COVID world and brand new construction and all that stuff too as well. So I think it was really insightful, really eye-opening that people maybe don't quite fully understand what all goes into opening a restaurant. And then also on top of it, the, all the additional challenges you can find yourself in because of COVID. Uh, it's not. It's definitely not like it used to be uh, in terms of quick turnaround times. Not that it probably ever was quick turnaround times for opening a restaurant, but it's definitely takes longer than it used to. So again, make sure to follow them on Instagram at J Anthony Brown and also at the Aperture Cincy and that's Cincy with an I instead of a Y at the final letter. Also make sure to follow us on Instagram at Spoon Mob, Twitter, Facebook. We're on there too as well. Check out the website. Make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Check out back catalog of chefs and guests, which come out every Thursday. Parts Down Known, Wednesdays. Uh, we're kind of in like a every other Wednesday mode right now. That's, you know, it's either every Wednesday, every other Wednesday, something like that. We might even uh, just kind of binge watch a few and uh, kind of put them out like Thanksgiving week or week of Christmas or something like that. So people have some content since we're not going to have a chef interview for those weeks. Uh, so there's something for people to listen to while they're traveling or, or whatever, or if they're just sick of their family because uh, they've been around them for too many days straight or something like that. So appreciate everybody listening. Uh, more stuff coming, working on stuff for 2022. So excited uh, about all that stuff that's getting set up and you know, appreciate everybody listening, helping spread the word. If you're new kind of to the podcast or to following us on Instagram, welcome. Continue to tell your friends and everything. We'll talk to you guys next week.